In this world, people are born with a cross on the back of their palm, which hides magical power. These crosses come in four types. The fourth cross has a short range, but its power and shot speed are quite high, plus it is the fastest to activate. This type of cross is used in close combat. The third type of cross also has high firepower, but it has a richer range and can come in handy in mid-range combat. The second cross is specialized in high firepower, but it has low firepower. It also has a huge range and thus this cross has incredible value at long range. Well this is the first cross to appear on the arm of the protagonist. It quickly reaches its limit in battles and there is absolutely no advantage to it at all. Firepower is quite low, and it can't even activate magic. This cross specializes stupidly in manufacturing, but he is a magical warrior. The protagonist conducts an experiment in which he uses the power of the first cross, which is not normally useful in battles. He has activated a meteor core. The first cross only specializes in artifacts. In other words, if you use magic tools, magic is used, but in the case of normal items, it doesn't. A meteor shower happened. Meteorites collided with the surface of the earth. As a result, the guy sank the island. The meteor shower is created by magic pulling meteorites down. It is a magic where his cross, similar to the second one, can be used without the help of tools. But to use the first cross, he needed to prepare magic tools first. But that also takes time to activate, which meant it wouldn't work against the troops. The other side of this world is called outer space here. It is said that monsters with incredible power live there. They are also known as divine beasts. You would like to fight such opponents who say their magic theory isn't good enough. That their theory magic can't even handle with all its power. That's his ultimate dream. They are superior to people like him who can't use the meteor shower without tools. The protagonist must become stronger. But with a cross like his, there are fewer ways to develop. The first way is to learn the unexplained magical theory that the celestial beasts who know perfect techniques seem to possess. With this power, one can raise the dead or travel through time, doing things that are unattainable with their theory of magic. In addition, with this power, he could enlarge his muscles or strengthen them. However, to master these techniques, he must fight heavenly monsters. It's like asking what came first, the egg or the chicken. The chances of such a development are very slim. The second way is reincarnation with a new body, but there is no guarantee that he will get the body he wants. This option the guy will leave for last. The third way is to find himself allies. Allies will increase his fighting power. Of course, he reached this conclusion quite a long time ago. The protagonist tried many times, but his partners ran away each time. They didn't believe in their own strength. He just has to find such allies who won't run away and will be loyal. Maybe choose demons. No, the demons won't ally with him. That's because their goal is to bring humans to their doom. There are other races that can use magic, aren't there? Like dragons. One of the dragons addressed the others saying that such an opportunity comes once in a lifetime. A hundred years ago, they were almost exterminated by this man named Gaius, but now that he is gone, they have nothing to fear. The dragon offered to exterminate the humans and make a bloodbath of them. It was time for revenge. At this time, Guy lowered himself onto the monster's forehead. This surprised the dragon. He thought they had a barrier. The protagonist apologized for causing pain at his parade, but he wasn't dead yet. Everyone present realized that Guy himself was in front of them. It was strange that he was still alive. Guy hadn't been around for a hundred years. He hadn't even thought about it. Time flies when you get caught up in your research. Guy said not to worry. He's not here to fight. It sounded unexpected to everyone. He's looking for partners. Guy asked where the strongest dragons could be found. If there aren't any, a dragon with potential is also good. According to the monster, if he was looking for a strong dragon, he had already found one. The dragon was going to kill him. The dragon called him a stupid and arrogant human. The attack had no effect on the guy. The dragon's breath is believed to be the same as a regular dragon. But it's actually an advanced and complicated magic. If you add some magic power to the weak point of the magic formula, the flame will simply dissipate. The fact that it dispelled the dragon's breath shocked everyone. However, the magic power that was involved didn't go anywhere. It would be a waste of magical energy, so Guy would return it to the dragon. He reflected the magic back at the opponent. This blow crushed the dragon. The dragons did not believe in the likelihood of such a thing from a single volley. According to one dragon, breath is a formula. If you break its weak point and destroy the formula, you can steal magic power. He heard that this is the underline of the action of hunting Guy's dragons. The protagonist suggested going back to their old theme. Where are the powerful dragons? He had lost his informant and asked if anyone would be willing to replace him. He was answered that there was a temple to the north of here. There lives a dragon whose name is the Dragon of Darkness. Gaius asked what kind of dragon it was and whether it was strong. As it turned out, this dragon was sent to help the people in exchange for gems. It pains me to say this, but its power is real, if it weren't, it would have been dead long ago. 
Kai concluded that what he really wants is for him to get rid of this dragon. In any case, Guy was looking for allies, so knowing that, it in no way cancelled out the information he had already received. The protagonist thanked him and said that he would try his luck there. The dragons looked at each other. They decided that he would not be able to defend himself against all the dragon's breaths at once. They all left. In their opinion, he could defend himself against one blast, but not that many. The dragons were glad that they had killed Guy. Now the whole world belonged to them. Guy endured the attack and reminded them not to claim so easily that he was already dead. The dragons were shocked. He noticed that they were too dumb, for they couldn't even distinguish the power of this magic. He thought of leaving them alone, but now that they tried to attack him unexpectedly, he can't just leave it alone. When asked why he was still alive, Guy replied that it was pretty hard to kill him with this kind of magic. Guy decided to show them how to kill. This is an unprocessed magic stone, also called shit stone. It can't be used as a magic tool. Gaius will completely fill it with magical power. The shit stone doesn't have enough power to contain that much magical power. But by combining it with the spell inside the magic stone, its destruction can be prevented by the power of their bond. This subtle magical initiation is the domain of knowledge of the first crest. The result is an unstable magic stone, filled to the brim with a large amount of magical power. The magical power within the magic stone is on the verge of exploding due to trying to find a way out. The dragons realized that this was a bad thing. They decided to stop this monster using breath since they doubted that he could use this barrier for a long time. The guy reflected the blow and said goodbye to them. There was a tremendous explosion. One dragon was still alive. Guy returned the debt for the information he'd given him about the Dragon of Darkness. If he valued his life, Guy advised against throwing away anything else. He set off on his journey. At the Temple of the Dragon of Darkness, Gaius realized that this was the very place that that dragon had spoken of. One could feel the dragon's mana on the other side. Even from here, Guy could tell that he was powerful. The protagonist hoped, he's a young dragon and won't be as stupid as those old men. Hope dies last. The dragon asked why the man had come here. Gaius replied that there were rumors of a dragon who helped people in exchange for precious stones. He was allowed to enter. Everything inside was strewn with jewels. The dragon of darkness asked him to tell him what his wish was and what he would give in return. The boy asked to be his companion, and what he would receive could be discussed now. This surprised the creature. Gaius wanted someone like him to fight at his side. He would take care of the equipment and make the dragon stronger. The protagonist asked if he agreed. Silence ensued. The dragon left. Now the bloke said he wanted him as his companion, said he'd make him stronger. And humans are very humble. How amusing. Guy thanked for the praise. As it turned out, it was not praise. The dragon of darkness said not to be conceited. He only helps people for a reward. If a person continued to talk like that, he would definitely kill him. The protagonist realized that whether he would be with him or not depended on the reward. According to the creature, any job it takes on is up to him. But dragons like him are very greedy. And moreover, there is no stone in the world for which he would work with a man. The boy asked if he really thought so. He showed a stone that is very valuable to dragons in many ways. But does this young dragon know about it? Guy surprised the dragon. The monster asked where he got it. Guy realized that the dragon knew. He found it in the vicinity of Mount Ronsdia, where else? Diabolos was the evil dragon king. He ruled in the vicinity of Mount Ronsdia about 150 years ago. He was called the strongest dragon and his reign brought tens of thousands of deaths, both human and dragon. This stone is from his heart. Inside the heart lies a rare stone created from blood called the Dragon Killer Stone. The Dragon of Darkness realized how it came to be in the possession of a human. Yes, he had killed him. Gaius decided to tell how it happened. It shocked the monster. Guy fought it, wanted to back off and not kill it, but it was weaker than he thought and the next thing was clear. So, the main character still wanted an answer. If he gave him this pebble, would the dragon become his companion? The creature wondered what would happen if it said no. Gaius replied that he would then have two such stones. This made the dragon angry. It was not going to bow down to the man. The enraged dragon roared. According to Gaius, it was a good deal after all. We should try not to kill him too, it hurts to die. So let him try not to die. The monster bowed down and begrudgingly apologized. Gaius didn't understand what was wrong. The dragon will do whatever it wants, just don't have to kill it. He will not be so impertinent again. If the fellow is interested in his jewels, you can have as much as he wants. The creature continued to plead with him. The castle was completely destroyed, and the dragon is quite strong, however. The protagonist wondered if it could hear him at all. Gaius had said he wouldn't kill him if he joined him. After all, the dragon agreed. Guy remembered the monster saying that dragons were proud creatures. The dragon asked what he wanted from him if he killed Diabolos. Gaius asked not to worry. He would soon be stronger than that lizard. The creature didn't think he was a lizard. After all, he is the legendary evil dragon king. According to Guy, he wasn't strong. 
Guy asked if he could turn into a human. The dragon happily agreed. Dragons have a special skill by which they can take on human form. In their true form, of course, they are stronger, can breathe fire, and so on. But Gaius thinks they have more capabilities in human form. They retain their physical and magical abilities after transformation. In addition, they can use different magic exactly like humans. But because their magic circuits are not as complex as humans, high-level magic is not available to them. But with their help, one can approach it. That the dragon turned into a girl was quite unexpected. He immediately realized that she needed clothes and asked her to wear this. It seemed to be her size. The girl began to dress. Gaius wondered how young she was. She didn't seem to have any simple knowledge, though she would still have to be taught. The girl asked if she was dressed properly. She is Iris, a dark dragon. The girl is happy to meet him. Since dragons don't lose their protection even in human form, she doesn't need armor. Simple clothes are quite enough. The boy remembered the weapons. Iris thought it was fragile, though Guy was proud of it. It's made of super pure magic steel, raising the level of magic proficiency just to the heavens. With it, even a three-year-old child can use magic. Moreover, it's so well made that with its minimal weight, simplicity, and elegant design, you still get great results. Iris replied that it bent. According to the guy, no one expected him to be used like this. He supposed she didn't know that anyway. He bent again a few more times. Guy had coated it with soft magic steel with a high strength adamantium alloy, it shouldn't bend at all. Iris swung the weapon. It wouldn't bend. But now it has lost in its elegance. Now it looks like a weapon for barbarians. Guy's magic device jingled. He didn't remember turning it on. The girl inquired after him. It was a monster identifier. It starts ringing when there's a strong demon nearby. It can send you to him, just press the button. It seemed like Guy was making it to fight strong demons, but killing them got boring. So Guy switched it to a mode where it would show enemies leveled no lower than Diabolos. Iris understood what he meant. They'll go and fight someone strong. This confused the girl. She didn't think normal people enjoyed it. They went on the attack. The guy asked what she was doing. Iris was much more comfortable on four legs. Guy thought if they showed themselves like this, the enemy would definitely be surprised. It could be made their plan. The enemy forces were on their way. Class 8, Lord of the Ogres. At this time, someone was already fighting the enemy. For this couple, killing rank 8 demons was so easy. After all, they're 11th grade. The strongest fighters in the kingdom. They were Jeryl, the Witch of Perdition, and Reiter, the Demigod of the Blade. The fringes of the border of the border of the Kingdom of Mares. The children were having fun playing hide and seek. A boy noticed some movement behind the house. Instead of the boys, he discovered something terrifying. There was a huge ogre standing in front of him. The monster swung its weapon and killed the child. The commander was told that the search was over. There are no survivors here. The man realized it was a surprise attack by the ogres. Something suddenly appeared that made those present horrified. Suddenly an ogre appeared ahead. It was too big. It's most likely in 8th grade. So he's the lord of the ogres. The ogre dealt a crushing blow to the knights. People saw that the monster killed so many with one blow. He is very strong. The knights were frightened. The commander ordered them to hold formation. If they lost, who would protect the people next? The warriors didn't understand how they would do it. Suddenly, a girl who was using a binding arrow appeared. She called out to one of her comrades. The fellow made a large cut. The stricken monster immediately fell to the ground. The knights were surprised that only two people had killed it. They are adventurers. The other girl used healing. This was unexpected by the warriors. She asked if everything was all right. They were magic bow expert Biles, magic swordsman Kaido, and Saint Noel. All of them had a class of 10. According to the knights, they had expected this from class 10 adventurers. They dealt with them so quickly. They were all extremely grateful to them. If it wasn't for their help, they wouldn't have stood. They decided to take care of it, withdraw and regroup. The adventurers prepared for battle again. They were surrounded by ogres. They assumed it was a group of ogre lords. But lords don't go around in groups. So why are there so many of them? The knights realized they were finished. There was a quantum explosion. The girl killed them all in one blow. Everyone realized that she was an 11th grader. It was Jeryl Abendroth, the strongest mage of the Mare's kingdom. She had come here to eradicate all monsters by order of his highness. The reason for this order was the huge number of monsters. It strongly resembled the activity of magic, so the first thing she did was to look for traces of it. The monsters crept closer. There's also a group of lords over there. Everyone didn't understand what was going on here. The ogres were about to attack. The knights were fleeing. Jeryl was asked to leave a couple of monsters behind. There was an explosion. One guy chopped up the enemies. According to him, once people realize that these are regular monsters, they will stop running away from them. Everyone realized that Reiter was here and they were saved. 
Both of the strongest fighters in the kingdom with 11th grade are here. The Witch of Perdition Jural and the Demigod of the Blade Reiter. Their current goal is to slay the dragon. The dragon is a loner, the dreaded Lemain, who has destroyed 18 cities and villages. He already has over 70,000 victims to his credit. Reiter and Jural, both 11th graders, and they alone have been sent to destroy it. Dragons possess powers unheard of to humans. One breath of them can turn an average city to ashes. If you look at history, at least a couple of countries have been destroyed by dragons. But those times are long gone. It's been 200 years since any city has been burned down by dragons. And none of the countries now know how to fight dragons. It is said that more than 200 years ago, there was a wise man who hunted dragons under the pretext of training. He could calmly slay a dragon capable of destroying an entire country. If he really exists, she would like to meet him. There were too many enemies, and it seems like there are even more, so they're on the right track. The enemy has been killed. Noel healed Kaido. Juriel and Riyadar realized that it was time for them to go. The girl said that only they would go further, let the others go back. The adventurers wanted to go with them. Kaido asked not to worry about them. They can leave them behind if they become a burden. They are ready to die. The beam headed towards the guy's body. Everyone realized that it was a magic attack. The beam headed towards each of them. Jural had time to create an obstacle for him. There was no doubt. It was a beam of light. A very simple and quick spell. But it usually won't kill a small animal. Most use it to strike the eyes of an enemy. Even Reiter was struck down by it. How much mana was invested to put down an opponent like that with the first shot? No, a person with that much power shouldn't exist. It is a great fortune that her reflective barrier worked. Juriel asked who he was. She was answered that he was the one sent to kill them. The Dragon of Horror Limane. As a human, he can't use Dragon Breath, which is his strongest weapon. And even in that form, he himself is much weaker. Everyone knows that. Limane saw that she knew a little more about them. Since that was the case, Juriel decided to show him something else. The spell she is preparing is called a Comet Fall. It's quite complicated and requires a lot of time and effort. If it succeeds, no living thing will be able to defend against it. She has only one chance. He only uses his breath on pests. They are easier for him to deal with in human form. The witch realized that he did not classify her as a pest. The enemy replied that he definitely did not. She thought he didn't know about the spell yet. There was still some time left. Limane asked what was behind her back and directed a beam of light. That means he noticed. She was saved from the impact. The savior turned out to be Reiter. He admitted that it was a little unpleasant. Juriel was glad he was alive. Although, he is, after all, of the 11th grade. But she could feel the healing rays and didn't remember him being able to use magic. Or he could, but for a very short time and week. The boy realized it was time to use it. The witch wondered what it was. It was a monster identifier. The girl noticed that it looked like a simple amulet. Reiter decided to buy them some time. Jiriel should hurry up and use the spell. Limane realized that it was a melee and decided to use the sword too. They entered the battle. The opponent remarked that it was not bad for a human, but it was no match for a dragon. Reiter noticed the mystical barrier. He knew something like this would happen and he wasn't about to back down. He pushed the enemy away. According to the enemy, it looked like it wasn't even trying to scratch him. The guy replied that he had opened up, so the games were over. Ural thanked the fellow. She had just finished the spell. Too bad they didn't chat much. There had been a comic crash. Both thought they had succeeded. I doubt he could dodge. The monster had transferred the spell. According to him, there were only three people in this century who could use the comet's fall. Reiter's move came. Limane instantly recovered. It was not enough. He asked if they really thought such a spell would be enough to kill him. This surprised Ural. He recovered even from a direct hit. She didn't understand how to even kill such a monster. Reiter was pleased to have a worthy opponent. Their bout would be legendary. In his style, he used blinding rage. He was about to strike his opponent. Limane noticed that he was finally comparable to a dragon. Juriel realized something had to be thought of. She decided to use another trump card she had to the full. Now, she had no margin for error. Her mana was running low. Falling Star. This spell is a level above the previous one. It requires an unrealistic amount of mana and is dangerous to the caster. But she has no choice. At this time, Lemayne struck Reiter with his sword. The enemy cut his body in half. He killed him, but Jarl's spell was complete. His death would not be in vain. The girl used the Falling Star. Even from there, he won't be able to dodge. It's a direct hit. May he die and erase his existence from this world. Limane used a spell. He was able to deflect the blow with an air barrier. This shocked the girl. The dragon was surprised that she even knew what it was called. And he wondered what she was cooking this time. Busy. Juriel couldn't believe that he could fend off this type of spell. Was he playing with them? There was nothing she could do. They had lost. In addition, the air barrier formed a dome around them and restrained her movements. She couldn't even escape. 
The girl thought that now she would die. The enemy leaned towards her. He asked why she didn't use her power. The witch understood why he would keep her alive. Gerald asked if he wanted her to test it on him. In fact, there's a kind of power in it. It goes against people's understanding of magic, and it's similar to the barrier that Lemayne is using now. But she can't use it now. The girl didn't want to. The enemy didn't want her to think he enjoyed such a thing, but she left him no choice. A crunch was heard. He immediately realized that the barrier was breaking. Lemayne wondered if Jeryl was doing it, but she couldn't break it now. They realized that two people had intervened, that is, Gaius and Iris. Gerald noticed that the girl next to him was not human after all. The enemy asked who they were. Guy felt sorry that it was a false alarm. Iris asked if he wanted to avoid the battle or what. Iris was bored. She offered to keep Lim in. Gaius was unwilling to do so. It's not like they're immortal. The enemy wondered where they even came from. Guy came at the call of the monster determiner, but he sees he's too late. Yes, and he's not interested in fighting a dragon. The companion didn't understand whether he wanted to fight or not. Gaius saw no reason to fight someone so weak and uninterested, but neither could he let him live. Limane let go of Juriel. The girl remembered Reiter talking about the monster identifier. The opponent told the man to stand where he was standing and apply restraining movement. Gaius noticed that it was forbidden magic. Limane saw that Guy was also aware. He inquired about his further actions. Juriel was surprised that someone else knew about the forbidden magic, but how did he realize what kind of magic it was, and even in such a short time? And how was he able to break the barrier? The girl wanted to know who he was. Gaius continued that alas, Lemain is not a monster from the depths of the universe, which means he is very weak. His spell is a mess, but let him look at its structure. It's horrible. Juriel realized that he really could analyze spells very quickly. No human can do that. The enemy wished for the guy to be crushed by the barrier and die. Guy realized that the enemy would not believe him until he showed. With a slight movement of his hands he was able to break the barrier. Everyone did not expect this. The protagonist asked if he now understood. Gaius remarked that he had managed to surprise him. Alas, the barrier was so fragile that he could not take a step without breaking it. Juriel didn't understand how he was able to break the top-level barrier. This did not please Limane. The guy asked how he, such a weakling, could use forbidden magic. He realized that the enemy was hiding his real strength. The protagonist's words surprised them more and more. Then Gaius would force him to show it to him. His turn to attack. So he'll start with the meteorite fall. It'll take him 10 seconds to cast the spell. If he doesn't want to die, he'll have to beef up his defenses. Gaius turned to Iris. He's going to teach her how to fight now, so make her memorize it well. His spell creation time is very slow. After all, his first level mark. Uriel didn't realize what he was doing. He noticed the first level mark. According to him, with a level 3 mark, it would take him one-tenth of a second to create a meteorite fall. It would take him half a second. That's a very large waste of time. That surprised Iris. He had said it would take 10 seconds to create it. The guy replied that he wasn't in any hurry. Guy wanted him to pounce on him as hard as he could. Juriel realized that the creation time of all his spells was very slow. After all, he had revealed that he possessed a level 1 mark. Lemayne noticed her and wished him dead. The witch noticed that the beam of light would hit the guy in the blink of an eye. If he could kill a rank 10 adventurer with it, then the holder of the first mark didn't stand a chance. Gaius drew his sword. With it, he was able to deflect the blow. The girl realized that he was not only a mage. The opponent was shocked. Humans don't have such reflexes. Gaius replied that it wasn't about reflexes at all and asked if he had realized yet. Guy questioned Iris if she understood why he was able to dodge. This embarrassed the girl. According to Guy, it's because when fighting, he looks at the changing direction of the opponent's magic flow. And with this information, he can also predict the enemy's spell. Him, why was he using such an obvious spell? Gaius didn't understand. Limane could have used something special after all. Seven seconds left. The fact that Guy could read the change in magic flow surprised Uriel, who could even do that in battle, but he was able to dodge the attack. This infuriated the enemy. He realized that he had a lot of combat experience and in that case decided to show him his real strength. Gerald noticed the virtuoso mastery of magic. Limane decided to use a space chopping blade. The guy's sword wouldn't stop him. He made a spatial cut. Guy drew his sword, which created an obstacle for the blade. The following shocked the people present. The protagonist reflected the spatial cut with his sword. Limane thought it was impossible. According to Guy, if you put a spell into a weapon, it would be no problem to reflect his simple spell with it. Juriel was surprised that spatial cutting was a simple spell for him. The boy asked what else he had. Four seconds left. He began to annoy his opponent. The enemy decided to go to extreme measures. Gerald realized that his magic power had increased dramatically and he was turning into a dragon. Gaius was surprised that he had finally decided to show something worthwhile. 
Limain is half dragon, half human. His magic power has increased too. Could use human magic, but with the power of a dragon. That makes sense. The enemy said proud to see him like this. After all, Gaius was about to die. He used a magical wave of destruction. The blow had almost reached its goal. There was an explosion. Juriel thought that no barrier would protect against such a spell. But that man, Limain left. He thought that all humans were too weak against them. Just pathetic worms. Gaius stood his ground. Three more seconds to go. Two seconds. He couldn't believe that this was his opponent's strongest attack. Maybe he would show what he could do. Limain thought it was impossible. Juriel was surprised that he used summoning circles to attack. Instead of using a defense spell, he counterattacked. Not to mention that his magic circle was too small. The girl didn't understand how he was defending himself. According to the guy, the incomplete structure of the spell is very weak. If you hit the center of the spell, you can easily destroy it. Uriel understood that he was analyzing the flaws in the structure of the spell as it flew towards him. When asked, Iris replied that she was listening to the guy. It looked like Limane had decided to fight to the end. Zero seconds left. His turn. Gaius made the meteor fall. The spell worked immediately. He advised us to hurry if there was anything left in store. Otherwise, Limane would die. The enemy thought that the meteorite fall would not be able to break the barrier of the void. Juriel remembered that barrier spells were his speciality. He had managed to protect himself from the falling star. A spell a level lower, a meteorite fall, wouldn't even scratch him. No matter how skilled a mage he is, he can't slay a dragon. Gaius doubted that he would definitely be alright, and asked what the others thought. The decisive moment was seconds away. The shot managed to break the barrier. The spell resulted in an explosion. The enemy was defeated. Juriel was shocked that he had killed the dragon of terror, Lemain, yet so easily. She wondered who he even was. In the end, Gaius didn't see any of the forbidden magic, and he knew it would end this way, but it was a shame. What was left of the enemy was the dragon soulstone, but its form is distorted. It seems that the forbidden magic had affected it greatly. The dragon's body is gone, but his stone is useful to him for future research. By studying it, the protagonist can learn more about forbidden magic. Jeryl realized that his power was many times greater than hers, even though she was considered the best in the kingdom. The girl turned to him. She asked about the meteorite fall spell. She wanted to know the secret of its power. The boy replied that it was the very thing. According to Juriel, his barrier she couldn't break even with a falling star, but he. It is quite different from the one she knows. Guy realized that's what he felt then. Guy realized that she was the one who had used the shooting star. The girl thought she had managed to interest him. Maybe she could get a chance to impose herself as an apprentice like that girl. She had a level 2 mark. It was good for high-level spells. But even if Gerald did ask for it, she didn't think he would agree. Gaius had said that if there was something she wanted to say, it was better to say it now. The girl thought it was something unequal. One must offer something in return. Something that would interest him. Then he was interested in forbidden magic. Juriel wouldn't be surprised if Gaius noticed it in her. There's no way he wouldn't notice. But she still doesn't know what he'll do with her. Human experimentation. The girl is willing to bet he won't have a problem with torture. He must be careful. Any mistake could cost her her life. The guy asked if she was interested in the meteorite fall. She was embarrassed. According to her, he thought she was interested. Guy asked Iris's opinion, who didn't know what to answer. The girl confirmed the interest. There is no turning back. If she wanted to escape, it wouldn't work. She took an interest in him. He and Iris were surprised. To Guy, interest in him sounds interesting. Gerald didn't mean to be rude, but his mark. She's level 1 and not really suited for battles. The guy replied that everyone knows that. So, he doesn't think her words are rude. The girl wondered why he was so strong after all. Guy realized that she was interested in his strength. According to him, it was all the results of hard training and his genius. He didn't know how to explain. Juriel asked him to teach her too. She would do anything. This surprised them. The boy questioned why she wanted to get stronger. Juriel wanted to defeat someone. No, she wanted to kill him. Guy noticed that their goals were similar. There was something else he wanted to ask. Namely whether this someone was connected to the forbidden magic lurking within her. The girl realized that he knew about the magic stored within her. Gaius knew it from the beginning. Her magic carried traces of distortion. Juriel thought she had been able to hide it all. The protagonist asked Iris if she knew that. The girl didn't understand what he meant. The guy thought she seriously didn't notice. According to her, of course she had noticed. Guy decided to help her get stronger. But still, she would be able to gain his knowledge. This is it, the condition of her training. For such a thing, Juriel was willing to give even her hand, or both, if necessary. The protagonist wanted her to tell him about ultimate magic. The effects, the drawbacks, how to get it. It didn't seem enough to her. The girl held out the book to him. It'll take a long time, but here's the gist of it. The boy noticed that the author of the book was Jural Abentroff, 
that is, she herself. It contains everything one needs to know about forbidden magic. Kai said he would love to read it. He remembered another condition. She must become his companion. This surprised the girl. Kai wanted to start his own group and was just looking for companions. Naturally, it would be easier to train them all that way. Her mark goes well with her desire to become stronger, but she has another talent. Even he was able to comprehend a huge combat potential with his first mark, and with hers, it would take much less time and effort. Jeriel agreed to be his companion. Since they knew of her forbidden magic, she thought they would conduct experiments on her. The boy joked that it sounded like a plan. Iris was glad they had more companions, but she was hungry. Jeriel is considered one of the strongest in the kingdom. She's a witch of destruction. I mean, she couldn't even scratch Lim in. But it seems the girl was carried away by her title, and he killed it as if it were just some child to him. Gaius wanted her to be his companion. Jeriel didn't understand who he was. Undoubtedly, he has incredible power, but there was something that interested her about him. She wondered who this girl was. Her magical aura didn't look like a human's, but it was obvious that that person was teaching her how to fight. Yurel noticed that she looked hungry. The girl offered her some food. This pleased Iris. She liked the food. Jeriel inquired if she was really not human. Iris replied that she was a dark dragon. The girl recalled that she was known among others for her strength and cruelty. Iris asked permission to ask her for something. She wanted Gerald to help her understand him when he began to say difficult things. When Gaius heard the monster identifier, he thought he was going to see a strong monster, but in reality, it was just a dragon. Nevertheless, he got something. He found one mage who agreed to be his companion. The girls seemed to get along. Uriel has the second mark. It's great for long-range spells. Not to mention, she possesses a forbidden magic that he's been wanting to learn for a long time. But she can't seem to use it right now. The protagonist just thought of forming a group, and on the same day, he found two companions already. But he had bad memories about it. Everything was fine until their first assignment. They left him at once. In other words, you have to act right away. Gotta make a good impression on them so they don't leave right away. You have to be careful. Iris liked the girl's name. It sounded like something delicious. She seemed to have frightened Juriel. The guy noticed that Iris was responding strangely a lot. We need to watch her more to make sure she doesn't make a mess. As Juriel could notice from her magic power, Iris is not human. And that's why she lacks human common sense. He told Iris that she needed to learn to understand people more. Juriel wondered who would teach her. Gaius replied that of course he would. Guy noticed that her reaction is very strange. Does she think he is not up to such a task? Guy had lived with humans before he got into research, after all, he should be fine with understanding. The girl asked if she could get his name. When Juriel said, he remembered that he himself had not introduced himself. The guy's name shocked the girl. She realized that he was the guy everyone knew. The legendary battle mage who had disappeared 100 years ago. The one who had destroyed countless magical creatures, completed many tasks of the highest rank, and saved the kingdom from destruction more than once. A legend among legends. A Gaius with enough power to become the embodiment of a god himself. Not to mention that he has as his goal the destruction of all dragons. Iris was terrified that she would be killed. Gaius didn't remember having such a goal, so she could calm down. Although, over the past 100 years, he had heard enough stories of dragons being destroyed. Come to think of it, he had indeed killed a few dragons on that list. Since they were his companions, it was better to tell them the truth. In fact, he had killed about a hundred dragons. That he had killed about a hundred dragons in the past 100 years surprised Ural. She had never heard of dragons rampaging and destroying so much. According to the guy, it was all because he killed them in one day. Everyone was shocked. It scared Iris. He told her that he was not going to kill his companions and asked her to calm down. Iris had heard that there was a magical ritual that required 108 dragon souls. He wouldn't say she was the 108th, would he? This was the first time Gaius had heard of such a ritual. Iris asked why he killed so many dragons then. According to him, they were too hostile to him. It was just self-defense. Iris continued to wonder. She said she would be obedient. Gaius did not understand what had become of her manner of speech. Jeryl thought it was incredible to kill a hundred dragons in a day, and they had almost been killed by just one. To be honest, Lemayne wasn't even strong, but if he said those words to her, she would be very upset. We should be careful with our expressions. The guy said this dragon was a tough nut to crack, and the strongest one he'd ever killed. Uriel didn't think that for an intermediate level group, he was a problem. Gaius didn't realize what was wrong with her and asked if she was alright. The girl replied that she couldn't even consider herself a mid-level group now. After all, they had lost even though they were considered one of the strongest in the kingdom. Before, she thought, but now, Gaius realized that they were not mid-level, and they were still considered the best in the kingdom. In these 10 years, he thought he had reached about their level of strength, but then what went wrong? 
The boy asked if she had ever heard of the book he had written. According to the girl, it was called An Introduction to Magical Combat. That turned out to be it. He also wrote practical applications of battle magic and the basic theories of magical battles. He wrote them 100 years ago, thinking that they would help mages improve their skills, thinking that reading the books would be enough to reach about Gerald's level, but the girl said that these books had the wrong title. Gaius asked why she thought that. Maybe he made a mistake when he copied the books with magic, and that was why no one could read them. Uriel explained that they are hard for beginners. Even she didn't understand much of what was written. The girl heard that scientists from the Kingdom's Institute of Magic work every day trying to decipher them, and Gaius thought he had written them in the language of this continent. As it turns out, the problem is not the words, but the content. It's too hard to understand. If anything, Gaius did omit some points, but if he had written everything, the books would have come out in about a hundred volumes, no less. He decided to stop talking about the books and talk about the members of the group. He would like another companion. He has the first mark. Jural has the second. Iris is a dragon. Her physical abilities surpass theirs. Gaius asked what Iris thought about which mark he wanted. The girl hesitantly suggested a fourth. This turned out to be correct. He wanted the fourth mark. In fact, he knew a swordsman with the fourth mark. The guy thought that Gerald knew him too. It's Rither. The girl repeated his name questioningly. Guy asked if he wasn't in her group. The protagonist thought he was with her. Juriel asked if he was sure he was talking about Reiter. Guy replied that he might have got the letter wrong. He forgets almost nothing when it comes to magic, but he can forget people's names. Guy thought about creating a memory spell. Gerald reported that Reiter sacrificed himself in the battle with Limane. He was cut in half, unless he has a resurrection spell. Even Gaius couldn't resurrect people. He asked if she was sure he was dead. According to the girl, he must be there. Gaius examined his body. Something didn't look like he had been cut in half. Juriel wondered. Reiter opened his eyes and asked if they were talking about him. The girl was shocked that he had spoken. Reiter told them not to write him off so easily. Juriel didn't understand why he was still alive. The swordsman also asked why they were asking. The girl replied that he had been cut in half after all. Usually people die from something like that. Reiter did not think so. Guy understood. In humans, the core of the magical circuits is in the heart, and the control circuits are in the brain. Juriel didn't know that. So when you lose the lower half of your body, both circuits will still continue to work. If you are not trained, you will probably lose a lot of blood. In other words, if you cut a person in half, it's not enough to die if they can regenerate. Juriel thought that this was not normal at all. Reiter laughed and called her stupid. He was glad that he had finally met an understanding person. The girl thought she was strange. The swordsman asked if he was suitable for his group. Gaius thought that his balance group was now complete and was glad of it. He now had a complete group. He noticed that Juriel did not look pleased. Rather, she is anxious. She probably thinks he's out of his mind. We should see if she realizes that he really cares about his companions. Gaius inquired where their other co-partners were. Juriel realized he was referring to adventurers of the 10th rank. They were weaker than them. On the way here, they had persuaded them to return, but the dragon had killed them. They were too weak to protect them. That's what Juriel said. They seem to be buried here. The meteor hit scattered the earth here, very faintly, but he can still feel traces of magic, which means they are still alive. The protagonist thought the dragon didn't look at their vitals. There are many among dragons who like to mock their victims at the end. Perhaps he was one of those. He said that everything was fine. They could still save them. The guy used magic. The girl recognized the recovery spell and didn't understand why he was using it on the ground. Guy was surprised she didn't understand yet. A hand emerged from the ground. The spell helped the adventurers. It shocked everyone, especially Juriel. They didn't understand why they were buried and wondered about the dragon. Iris thought what he just did was really scary. The boy replied that if only a little. Reiter laughed it off, for the guys thought they were zombies. Guy decided to start their first group meeting. Juriel said that he made this quality furniture in an instant. Does he really have the first mark? Guy regretfully confirmed it. He healed those adventurers, told them to go ahead and report the slaying of the dragon. In the meantime, they would hold a meeting to honor the formation of their group. Before that, his groups had not existed for more than half a day. And the shortest time, that's two hours. It has been almost two hours since they were created. He does not want them to break a new record. If Guy wants to keep them together, they need one thing. A common goal. They need to find it and follow it, for their unity. First, Guy would want to give them a purpose. Of course, Reiter wanted to become stronger. Juriel's goal is the same. They want to get stronger. Iris hesitantly said that she also wanted to become stronger. Gaius didn't recall her saying such a thing before. The girl said she had. If she had a different goal, he asked her to better say it and not be shy. Iris decided to say again. 
Yes, she wants to become stronger. Next question, Guy asked how exactly they wanted to get stronger. Riaida replied that by fighting strong opponents. Jiral thought that by working hard and improving her mastery of magic. Iris echoed their words. Gaius realized that she was just repeating after them. He said they were both right. Combat power can be divided into three components, strength, skills, and stuff. The first two items wouldn't be a problem. The skills he will teach them, the items are not a problem either, but it is precisely their skills that make up the difficulty. But since they want to kill small dragons like that one, he is willing to personally train them. Reiter didn't think that that dragon was small. Jarl was surprised that Gaius would personally train them. According to him, once they gained skills, they would realize on their own which of the things they would already need. And then there would already be the next step, that is, choosing those things. Iris said that they will gather the materials they need and she will do the creation. Since Gaius mentioned, his first mark is the best for creating things. Gerald won't wait for this. Now for the power, the hardest part. Not to mention that being human, they are still limited in physical and magical strength. Iris's strength would be the greatest. The girl promised to give her best. But, she is surprised. Gaius can sense people's capabilities. According to Guy, the thing is that people have been dealing with tags all their lives. Judging by combat power, his weakest. But there's nothing stopping them from finding a way to surpass the human limit of strength. Reiter didn't know what he meant. Gaius was talking about powers that did not belong to humans originally. Juriel understood what he meant. Forbidden magic. There are monsters in space, too. They are called the spirits of burning stars, and they have that kind of power. Forbidden magic can also be described by properties, which means it too can be learnt and reproduced. Normally, when you kill a dragon, you can't replicate its killing breath. When you kill a hound, you don't get its superior sniff. But it's different with the spirits of burning stars. The winner has every right to take all the strength of the loser and become stronger. So, the spirits repeat this process until their power becomes omnipotent. By obtaining at least one fragment of them, they could begin to use at least a small part of their power. Reiter doubted this. Gaius offered to find out if he was right and turned to Jural. The girl confirmed his words. The ultimate magic inside her is what the organization she belonged to entrusted her with. But she still can't use it properly. Gaius asked if she could, would she kill the dragon that attacked today? Jiriel thought she could. Guy didn't think that her spirit fragment was something that fell to the ground for nothing. The protagonist asked if she happened to know where they got it from. The girl was clueless. Information about forbidden magic was hidden from mere mortals like her. Only the top of the organization knows the truth. Since that was the case, Guy decided to ask them himself. Reiter added that they would sincerely beg from them. With all their hearts and magic, Iris asked how they would use magic. Reiter showed his muscles, and the girl didn't understand what it was about. Jural had memories from the award ceremony. Although they were vague, Jural remembered that it was held at their headquarters. Reiter suggested going there. The girl replied that it was not that simple. She had tried to go through there once before, but all she found was a crater as if from a falling star. Guy concluded that they were covering their tracks. He asked Jural if the person she wanted to kill belonged to this organization. It turned out to be so. Everyone used to call him an agent and he is the most influential person in the organization. According to the protagonist, the first thing they do is to find traces of the organization. The second is looking for a way to obtain the forbidden magic, and in the process fight everyone and increase their skills. Reiter remarked that it sounded like a plan. Gerald has no objections. Iris asks where they're going first. First, they will go to the mayor's kingdom and report the murder of Limane. Once that information reached the organization, they would immediately receive an invitation. Gaius had been in this kingdom for a long time and thought it was beautiful. Reiter asked if he was sure it was still like that. Guy decided to use teleportation magic now. The fact that he could teleport so far away surprised the others. They would get there before those of their partners. The capital of the kingdom of Mares. They had already arrived at the place. In front of them was the barrier that the inhabitants were so proud of. Reiter had heard it had saved the kingdom many times. It is said that this impregnable barrier was created many years ago by a powerful magician. As it turned out, Gaius had created it. The swordsman guessed that he would say that. They entered the castle. Gaius could not see the guards at all. He inquired if anything had happened. Juriel replied that it was always like that here. Since the enemy cannot get through the barrier, there is no point in having too many guards. Reiter suggested that he not show himself to the king yet, go and have a bite to eat with Iris somewhere. But Guy has a small favor to ask of the king. The guards greeted Lady Jarl and Sir Reiter. Since they had arrived, then, they were able to kill Lyman. Juriel asked to report this event to the king. The guard replied that it would certainly be done. He asked for their pass. The guard asked where Guy and Iris's pass was. He did not know who they were. No one can enter without a pass. Jarl explained that they had helped them with the murder of Limane and asked to be let in with them. 
The guard replied that even if she asked, but that was his majesty's order. It was explained to him that he was Gaius, a battle mage, and asked if he had never heard of him. The guard scrutinized him and replied that he had not. Jiral and Reiter could pass, and they were asked to pass with them. In that case, they decided to try to ask the king for permission. They would try, at least. Iris wondered what Gaius would do now. The king was pleased to see Jiral and Reuter. He congratulated them on slaying the dragon Limane, as expected of an 11th ranker. They are the strongest in the kingdom. The two admitted that they weren't actually the ones who killed Limane. The king didn't understand what they meant. Jiriel asked that they be allowed to meet him. Reuter remarked that they had already come. Suddenly a portal appeared in the hall with Iris. What happened surprised those present and made Reiter laugh. Iris hesitated to come out, but Gaius insisted. He gave her a push and climbed out himself. The king summoned the guards and ordered them to be seized. The guards tried to grab Gaius, but they failed because he created an obstacle. They didn't expect magic to be used. Guy said they attacked without thinking. It was a strange reaction. He asked if they could hear him at all. The king said there was no need to hear anything from the intruder. The ruler asked how he got in. Deus explained that it was teleportation magic. According to the king, the barrier that the legendary mage set up for them is impregnable. Even teleportation magic doesn't work through it. The boy asked if by any chance their legendary mage's name was Gaius. The king asked who told him. Only members of the royal family know about him. The protagonist replied that no one had told him anything. He is Guy. This shocked the ruler. He ordered the guards to stand down. Above his head hung a portrait of the past king and the protagonist. A bit similar, but age is clearly not something that should be attributed to a battle mage. Since he doesn't believe it, Guy decided to get his hands on the surviving contract from when it was built. Guy presented it to the king. He has no doubt that the seal on it belongs to the royal family. The man released the guards. Despite their resistance, it was an order. The king has apologized. He has no ill intentions against Lord Guy. If there is anything he can do to help, let him only say. Guy thanked him and apologized for his bluntness, but first he would like to be registered in the kingdom under another name. This surprised the ruler. According to the magician, it was obvious that without him, he would be treated like a hero. Oh, and it would be much easier for him. The king thought he'd better keep his name. His name is very common these days. No one would even think he was a legendary mage if he said it. Guy concluded that there were a lot of Guyans living here. But why? He thought it wasn't a good name. In that case, Gaius would like to register his companion. Her name is Iris. The fact that she is a dragon shocked the king. Guy explained that as long as she looked like a human, it was all right. The king agreed. The king would do as they said. Guy asked her to act like a human. One more thing. The magician asked if he knew of an organization that endows people with forbidden magic. The king fell silent. He realized that he was talking about the Brotherhood of the Burning Stars. Gaius asked if that was what it was called. As it turned out, that was what the Royal Intelligence Department called her. Juriel didn't think they knew how to pick names. Reiter thought this society was highly secretive. The king will order that all possible information about them be gathered. This will take about a week. The process of getting a pass to come here isn't quick either, so he'll assign that task to the commander of the knights. He wishes he could help them too, but alas, there are more important things to do. Juriel felt that your majesty would handle it more quickly. The man explained that he was a king and he cannot forget his duty and responsibilities. Gaius realized that something was wrong here. He didn't think a king would assign his subordinates such tasks so often. Guy said he would wait. Jiriel and Reuter were not happy. The ruler apologized to them. Guy asked if something had happened. As it turned out, the two of them were not much at odds with the commander of the knights. Guy inquired what he was like. The girl replied that he was a hard worker. Guy suggested that he might be competent, but Jiriel denied that. A letter was received from the commander of the knights. Guy noticed that it had only been a couple of hours since the meeting. That was fast for him. He really is a hard worker. It would be good if there was some information about the organization there. What else could there be then? They thought there would be information about the Burning Star Brotherhood. Everyone was suddenly surprised. The commander had been ordered to treat them with all courtesy, but he wants to make sure that they also abide by the rules of the kingdom. For starters, they must give him a full report on the destruction of the Dragon Limane. Juriel reckoned that they wouldn't have enough paper for everything and if he didn't like something, he would immediately reject the request. Gaius realized what the commander of the knights was like. If he wants them to, they'll play by his rules. Austerity is not a bad thing, but if you repay it, you get a bad result. It has to be good. He asked only to be allowed to finish his report. Guy suggested that Iris try to write it. This surprised the girl. Guy thought it would serve her well. After trying, it turned out that since Iris was a dragon, she wouldn't be up to the task. Gaius didn't think she had it so bad, so he decided to write himself. The main character was saddened when he found out that he wasn't that strong. 
thought he could learn a little more about the magic forbidden, but alas. And at the end, his body just vaporized. Gaius is finished. Jiriel thought they would be refused. The girl explained that there were too many unclear points. He suggested she try it herself. She, on the other hand, didn't know how to write. Ryder decided to take the case. Guy hoped Ryder would write much better than them. Style didn't matter, what mattered was readability and credibility. It's better to look at what he wrote. He's pretty confident. Guy noticed that describing everything in an overly formal and truthful way sounds like the work of higher officials. He didn't think Reuters could write like that. And Juriel had forgotten that he was always good at documents. They decided to go and give him the report. The Office of the Commander of the Knights. Commander Manos took the report of Lemain's death, something he didn't like. According to him, if they thought it was a decent report, they were wrong. He gives them five minutes. Let them think about what's wrong with it and with them. Guy didn't expect this. Ryder took the report and promised to make things right. The protagonist thought he was perfect and did not understand his actions. Guy asked what he was doing. There is no ink on the pen after all. Ryder said to just believe him. Swordsman said they made adjustments and asked to check. The commander hesitated. He said that was better. It was even kind of modest considering they were battle mages. Iris asked not to look at her like that. She's only a dragon. Jarl wanted to know what exactly he didn't like. As it turned out, Ryder didn't change a single word. Juriel seemed to feel that his job was to get someone to fix something. When they said he was a hard worker, Guy didn't think in that sense. That is why Jarl and Reuter dislike him. Manos realized that he was Guy. According to the man, the management of battle mages falls under the jurisdiction of the knights. The report said they want to form a group with Jarl and Ryder. He asked if that was the case. Guy questioned what was wrong. The commander won't allow it. His joining them would result in a loss of combat power. Guy realized that he had no faith in his abilities. Manos inquired as to his rank. Guy asked what rank meant. This surprised the commander. The man thought that their king was indeed hopeless. The commander didn't understand how he could credit such a runt. He decided to give him a chance. Tomorrow Manos would test his strength with a trial. This surprised the lad. The next day, as Gaius realized, all he had to do was show his skills. He did. Battle mages are very powerful in themselves but it's difficult to measure their strength. That's why, for example, they can't just say that their king is also strong. The commander was surprised that the guy didn't chicken out. He appreciates his bravery. If he defeats the examiner, he will accept him and will allow him to form a group. He decided not to waste a minute. Time to introduce the examiner. It was a brave knight of the 10th rank of their order, Ganys. The man left. He was willing to bet they hadn't expected to see someone of the 10th rank here. Since he wanted to join the 11, he must be stronger than the 10th. Guy thought that this guy was too weak. When he fights one-on-one, -on -one, he can estimate his opponent's strength to some extent, but he is so weak that Guy can't even gauge his level. Jiriel wouldn't know what to do either if she was attacked by 15 infants. Guy doubted that the opponent was definitely strong. According to Jiriel, as a mere mortal yes, as a battle mage no. The protagonist wondered what would happen if he ended it all in one blow. No, maybe he's hiding his power after all. Then it would be necessary to stall for time. The guy thought about the consequences of using his power to its fullest. He didn't know what he should do. The commander thought that guy was silent because of fear. It's not too late to surrender, or he could try to let the girl go ahead and learn his strength. Since she's also joining their group, she should still be tested. This surprised Iris. Manos couldn't allow some weaklings to join the 11th rank. If they were unworthy or weak, then let them blame themselves. She agreed without question. He could see that the girl was no slouch. Gaius realized that if he didn't think of anything now, Iris would start a fight. It was time to begin. The opponent asked if the lady was in her right mind. After all, he has a rank 10. Iris knew. She wanted to make sure that she only needed to defeat him after all. Ryder asked Guy's opinion if she could calculate her strength. Guy had no idea at all. And that's too bad. He warned her that one wrong move would end everything. The commander thought, Guy stops her, for he is afraid she will die. After all, they are only pathetic wandering battle mages, what can be expected of them? It's already clear what the difference in strength is. Gaius didn't realize if he was stupid or pretending. It's not her who's going to die, it's him. The idea of taking something where they could demonstrate their strength without a fight arose. For example, target shooting. Gaius turned his attention to the statue of Manos above. He told her to break it. This angered the commander. Ganys told him not to worry. After all, she was made of a special alloy of mithril. That reassured him. They won't even be able to scratch it. It was time to show off. Iris managed to break the statue in two. This shocked the opponents. Gaius asked their opinion. Should he still let her fight them? Iris was happily willing to do so. That she had broken a statue made of mithril, and even from such a distance, surprised Ganys. As a knight, he would be ashamed to fight a little girl. Let her go her own way. 
So now it was Gaius's turn. Guy remarked that it wasn't a bad excuse he had come up with, if he's hiding his real power, but he's very skillful at it. He even wondered how. The commander realized that Guy had decided to fight and ordered Ganys to fight him. The enemy told him to approach and was about to show his real strength. Yes, he had grown a little stronger, but Gaius had not seen any of the spells he was preparing. If he's hiding them too, he just has amazing techniques. The enemy was about to strike. Manos remembered that Ganys could not be killed, those were the king's orders. Well, the commander said, if he didn't hear, that's his problem. The enemy's weapon shattered when it collided with the guy. They didn't realize what was wrong. Guy hadn't done anything yet. His clothes are enchanted to reflect damage. It's common for mages to enchant their items, after all. Now it's his turn. He asked me not to make such strange noises. Otherwise, it sounded like Guy was mocking him. Guy threw a punch. Didn't even try to defend himself. The protagonist assumed it was part of his plan. Still, the victory wouldn't count until he surrendered. So, we should beat him until victory. Gaius continued. The enemy was not yet thinking of surrendering. Manos was worried about Ganys. The boy realized that there were no hidden powers he was hiding. What a disappointment. The enemy fought to the end. He might be weak, but he had a lot of courage. Reuter surmised that he didn't give up since Guy wouldn't let him say a word. Guy realized this at once. The protagonist asked if the commander now recognized the creation of the group. According to the man, no way. Did they really think there would be only one opponent? Let them not get cocky. He ordered Gerald to fight them. Logically, since they wanted to join the 11th rank, then they themselves should be strong like them. Otherwise, he would not allow the group to be formed. The fact that he's forcing Ural to fight Guy surprised him. Although, he would have liked to see her fighting potential. The girl thought that they would damage the arena if they started a fight. Manos asked her not to worry. If necessary, he would call the men and they would create a barrier around them so they could fight at their own pleasure. Juriel asked his opinion. Gaius found it interesting. Yes and he would like to see her power. But the girl didn't want to fight him. In truth, she has no chance of defeating him. The guy didn't intend to fight at full strength. He only wanted to test her. Juriel decided to agree. Nanos forbade her to limit her strength. If she didn't put out her full strength, he would be refused to form a group. It was time for the battle to begin. The commander ordered the battle to commence. He wondered why Guy was so eager to form a group. He's too suspicious. Guy must prove to him that his intentions are pure. Juriel didn't want to fight Guy. Before the battle, Manos reminded them that it was forbidden to restrain their strength. If he noticed that they were not fighting at full strength, he would refuse to form a group. As he said that, Gaius asked to attack with all his strength. He wanted to personally see what she was capable of. The girl didn't think she could win. And to be honest, she would rather not fight him. Juriel concluded that since the commander said not to hold back, they could blow the whole place apart. Manos asked them to stop. He ordered all the knights of rank 7 and above to be summoned quickly. They set about creating a barrier. Gaius thought he was too late to decide to create a barrier, and they thought he would change his mind. Reiter said there was no way he would take it back. He's too proud. Three hours later. Although it's the basics, but if you learn how to manipulate your magic power, you can gain a huge advantage in battle. If you compress the magic like this, you can strengthen the spell. Juriel noticed that his technique required a lot of concentration and stamina. Reiter complimented that it was really impressive. And it's not just about concentration or marksmanship. The results of hard training are paying off. According to Guy, a phenomenon called primal magic occurs with this technique. But in forbidden magic this power is even greater and that is what he wants to achieve. This power can also be achieved by combining the power of several magicians together. It is indeed skillful. But, even with what we have, it should make for a pretty powerful spell. The commander interrupted him. He asked why they weren't finished yet and why all the mages were so slow. And this is what Gaius heard from someone who had spent so much effort to create the barrier. Ural said that they could finish it instantly. But it's normal for mages to prepare for such a long time. One of the knights reported that the barrier was almost complete. The construction is complete. The order was given to raise the barrier. Manos told them to begin. Gaius noticed that his barrier would break from just one of their shockwaves. And in fact, he gets a wild urge to kill him instead of fighting her. The girl advised against it. There would be trouble later. The boy will try to be more careful. But if the commander dies, he doesn't care. Gerald replied that they wouldn't get permission then either. Guy let her begin. The girl used the spell. The knights noticed that Lady Gerald's magic circles looked rather complicated. Another thought he was seeing a comet fall for the first time. It turned out to be not the first time, but a comet fall had never been so complicated. They realized that she was going to summon a falling star. She's going to destroy everything around here. Juriel thought that letting the opponent see her spell was already tantamount to losing. But she had yet to see anyone who could stop this spell. The girl summoned a fall. The commander thought that she was going to kill everyone here. 
Gaius thought of the immense destructive power. It would be effective if her opponent wasn't a mage. Manos grimaced and ordered the barrier to be strengthened. A falling star occurred. As a result, the barrier was beginning to break. The commander requested that it be rebuilt more quickly. Guy was still standing in the same place. According to him, this spell requires a lot of preparation and time, and she cast it rather quickly. He could see she wasn't wasting time. The girl noticed that he didn't even waggle an eyebrow. She didn't think she would say it, but his actions hurt her pride a little. Now it was his turn to attack. Ural let him try to block. Jiral realized it was some kind of artifact. The guy reminded her that he had the first mark. So his spells are very slow, but he created an artifact that increases his spell reading speed. Jiriel remarked that it was quite clever of him. The way of combat that he's about to show is excellent for duels against second and third marks. She could consider it the basics of magical warfare. Aeus directed the spell upwards. This agitated the girl. The commander threatened that one more such blunder and he would count it as a defeat for Guy. And while it was cooking, he prepared another. Jiriel realized it was a multi-level offensive and turned her attention to those magic circles. Manos asked what those circles were. Can't he cast any spell properly? The girl thought, although he's hiding his real power, but she can estimate it based on the mana flows. So, while the real spell is being prepared, let them deal with this. He applied the infernal arrow. The commander didn't understand what kind of spell it was. Uriel thought that. In that case, she used a magic reflective barrier. The fact that she sent them back pleased the knights. Gaius realized that Jural had anticipated the spell and acted accordingly. This was commendable, but he had expected the least from her. Guy created a quantum explosion. Cracks appeared in the barrier. The knights didn't understand what kind of power it was. There was no way he didn't have rank. It was better to get out of here. Manos asked Jural not to dodge and strike him back. The girl thought, the fact that she's at least on her feet is an achievement in itself. But it's just as he said. Now it's her turn to attack. Gaius didn't think so. His attack wasn't over yet. The girl forgot about the spell he was preparing. Gaius had said, the first mark spell takes a very long time to prepare. It's better to let him prepare the barrier. Juriel wondered if it was a meteorite fall by chance. The commander said that the meteorite fall was the previous stage of Uriel's spell. Just as he thought, Guy is a good-for-nothing mage. Guy knew he was an amateur himself, but he talks as if he knows everything. But that meteor fall he used against Limane was much faster. Juriel assumed that he was holding back. She doesn't think she could have defended herself against that meteorite fall. The boy replied that the spell is the same, and it has the same amount of mana. This surprised the girl. The knights heard a rumble and realized that it was really a meteorite fall. It was approaching the surface. The commander didn't understand why his spell was bigger than the falling star at Jurel's. The knights realized that they were finished and it was time to run away from here. The only difference is the compression of magical power. When Gaius fought the dragon, he compressed the spell, reducing its surface area but increasing its power. Uriel was surprised that he used a mass destruction spell like that. She had yet to learn and learn. There was an explosion. The commander's barrier broke. Manos didn't understand how that happened. He's a traveling mage. A mithril statue flew towards him. It fell right on top of the commander. Uriel survived by some miracle. Or rather, Gaius had adjusted the spell to her strength so that there was exactly enough to block it. The girl wondered if that was the case. Gaius remarked, she had learned something from this battle after all. And he also added that it really is easier to block a spell when you know it. Therefore, the speed of spell creation and tactics in battle are more important than simple brute force. If you think about it that way, the knights knew about her starfall. His meteorite fall, on the other hand, they didn't. If he hadn't worn, she's not sure she would have survived. According to him, delaying spells is the most basic thing you can do. It's also a great distraction. However, he can't fight with such weak spells all the time. The guy thought about hitting with something bigger. The commander begged them to stop. Guy replied that it's not like he would recognize his group if he didn't win. For now, this battle was not yet over. Manos authorized the group. He handed him the authorization and asked him to take it and leave. Gaius realized that he had had it all along. Guy asked if he could cast one last spell now that it was over. The commander replied that there were enough spells, but it had been ready for a long time. It would be a pity to interrupt it. Manos cried out in horror. Confetti appeared as a result of the spell. The commander fainted, and the knights rather summoned a physician. Gaius is glad he was able to talk him down. Jiral wasn't sure if he had persuaded him with words. Iris only now realized that it was already over. The next day, the knight apologized for the intrusion to Gaius. According to him, the king wished to meet with them. He asked to come with him to the palace. This is most likely about yesterday. But the knight did not think he would accuse him of anything. The king acknowledged that Commander Manos had overstepped his bounds and apologized for him. 
he also expressed his gratitude. They didn't understand why. The king explained that the man was incompetent as a commander but well-versed in politics. This made it very difficult to communicate with him. But thanks to them, he understood how to communicate with him. The governor asked Manos if the information requested by Mr. Gaius was ready. The man replied that concerning him he was sorry for what had happened. He had never been able to prevent him from forming a band. The king did not understand what he meant. As it turned out, about the fact that some low-grade mage was now allowed to take two people of the 11th rank away from their kingdom. He thought it was a terrible loss for them. But Gaius is rather stubborn, and it is difficult to deal with him. After a silence, the king asked for a repeat. Manos has a plan. He will prevent his group from forming and kick him out of the kingdom. The ruler asked if the name Gaius meant anything to him. The man hesitated for a moment. The king explained that it was Gaius who defeated an evil dragon when two adventurers of the 11th rank could not handle it. He asked if Manos had not realized yet. That surprised him. He thought that Reiter and Jeryl had killed the dragon. Manos realized that he was the same Gaius. According to the ruler, everything was written in the report they provided him. The commander said he had missed that point and apologized. The king offered him the choice of demotion or death. This shocked the man. He felt it was too much. The king concluded that he chose death. Manos began to deny it. Eventually, he sent him to a small rural area. Gaius realized, this is what happens to those who disobey the king. From now on, the ruler would decide their issue. Gaius was certainly flattered by his eagerness to help, but wouldn't it be wiser to give the job to someone else? The king replied that it was done in order to reduce rumors about them, all being well. The ruler hoped they would work together. Now to the point, the commander was instructed to gather all information about the Brotherhood of the Blazing Heavens, but the guy asked if he could ask him for information about forbidden magic as well. According to the king, they tried to collect it but it was more difficult than expected. They don't know what counts as forbidden magic and what doesn't. Gaius thought it was easy to discern. If something can't be described by existing theories of magic, then it's forbidden magic. Then, all their artifacts could also be classified as forbidden magic, because they can't describe them with what they know about magic. The boy realized that they could not explain the workings of his artifacts. It turned out to be this. Welcome to their world. Since Guy is here, he wants to see what they can't understand. They entered the room. According to the protagonist, it seems to say on the entrance that it is the royal treasury, but why does it look like a rubbish depository? Juriel replied, it is definitely a treasury. Here, for example, let her look at this artifact. She reckons it has the strength to be a national treasure. The guy didn't think so. He called it just ordinary rubbish. But Jeryl is sure of what she said. Iris liked the jewelry. Gaius didn't sense any inhibitive magic from it. Not to mention that half of the rubbish he created is here. Iris thought since this glowing stone was trash, then she could keep it. Jeryl explained that it was a national treasure. Guy noticed something. Though faintly, he sensed another magic. He pulled out the artifact. If you look closely, you can see the magic warping around the object. This distortion is something that cannot be described by the conventional laws of magic. It is the ultimate magic. Gaius asked the girl's opinion. Juriel recognized it. She had used it when she was in the organization. The girl had no doubt that it had something to do with forbidden magic, but she wouldn't advise using it. This artifact enhances people with the help of forbidden magic, but since it changes the bearer's soul, the chance of dying is very high. Only one person in a hundred can survive the process. Gaius thought that wasn't such a bad outcome. The protagonist offered to see if he would die or stay alive. Gaius concluded that it enhances a person's body and abilities, but by altering the soul. And only one in a hundred people can survive. It's not such a bad chance. He decided to try his luck. Juriel asked the others not to inhale the smoke. Guy felt the magic on himself. Iris felt sick to her stomach. Reiter felt that even for Guy, it was too much. Juriel explained by saying that this wasn't the kind of magic they used every day. An ominous smoke took over the room. Jeryl was worried about Guy's condition. Transcendent magic can change your soul. That's the best way to describe it. He was less human now, and one step closer to star beings. They didn't understand what less human meant. Gaius decided to show them. A great spark arose. Guy explained that he had compressed the magic so that pure energy was formed. This is the fusion of primordial magic. Ural noticed, this is the fusion he said he would learn someday. And now just at the snap of his fingers he can use it. Reiter had heard that only a few could do that. He didn't think he could do it the first time. Guy decided to do a little experiment. Jiral asked what he was up to. According to Guy, just fireworks. This alarmed the others, for if he lost control of the original magic, the kingdom would disappear from the face of the earth. Gaius asked them not to worry. It would not. A spark appeared in the sky. Uriel thought he had released magic and suppressed it. Guy said to just keep watching. A large wind appeared. Iris was being drawn there. The guys didn't understand where it was coming from. 
The wind was getting stronger. No one knew what was going on. According to Reuter, it looked like another of Guy's magic. Iris pleaded for the horror to stop. Such is the fusion of primordial magic. It is very unstable and could explode at any moment, so Gaius made it disappear this way. The reason why it's completely black is because its gravitational force is too great and the light can't leave it. The guy knew that the forbidden magic would allow him to compress the magic so much. But the result looks much better than his expectations. A great attraction that the light can't escape. Guy's surmised that he had created a black hole. Such is the magic of the forbidden. He liked it. Guy decided that was enough for today. The traces of magic were gone. That he could actually control such a monstrous power surprised Reiter. He didn't know how it worked, but he assumed Guy had become stronger. The protagonist replied that he was right. First, they need to find more similar artifacts of forbidden magic, and even then, learn how to control them. Reiter was in favor. He would do his best to become stronger. Juriel didn't understand how he had mastered such power at once. According to Guy, it was simple. A few years ago, he had done research on souls, and it was very similar to when you erase your soul. The girl asked why he would do such a thing. The guy thought it was a way to rewrite his mark. Iris didn't know what they meant, but it sounded very much like something painful. Now that guy had become stronger with the help of the forbidden magic, their next goal would be to find a large number of similar artifacts. But there don't seem to be any more. And while they wait for information about the Brotherhood, then he suggests they practice. Deus asked how they see it. Riata realized that he wanted to test their fighting style. Juriel is in favor. She learned a lot during their battle and is looking forward to further training. Riata reminded her that it was now his turn to fight. Iris hesitantly said she wanted to train too. Gaius decided that they would then start by testing their strength and skills. They would do the same as he and Jural. Riata would be next, which pleased him. The protagonist thought about the fact that it might be better to train Iris first. The girl reluctantly agreed. Gaius noticed that she was not too excited about training. Iris replied that she wasn't. It was just that they took her by surprise. The next day, Jiralee asked if she was alright, as she looked too tense. Iris replied that she was fine and asked if he would kill her if she didn't try harder. They didn't understand what she meant. Guy was not going to kill her. The girl stated that he wanted to throw her out of the band. Guy thought for sure that since she was a dragon, she could definitely eat them all, so it was better to get rid of her. The guy asked if she was really going to eat them. Iris of course didn't think so. He leaned over to her and complimented that even if she wanted to, she could try. The girl excitedly repeated that she would not eat them. That was good. At this moment, Iris is stronger than all of them. And since she's a dragon, she can become even stronger. She's not limited by things like tags, for example. Juriel realized that he had high expectations for her. This pleased Iris. The girl admitted that she was glad. But since she is a dragon, she cannot use magic. Gaius suggested that she start her training with magic. The girls was surprised. After all, she had said she couldn't use magic. According to him, using magic in battle gives a good advantage. To begin with, he gave her the task of smashing that target with some spell. But Iris couldn't use magic. Gaius told her not to talk nonsense. Her dragon's breath is magic too. The girl didn't know that. It turns out that many dragons think they can't use magic, but it's actually quite different. He'll help her. Let her try to shoot her breath out of the staff with her own. Just remember the way he does it in dragon form and transfer those sensations to the staff. Iris understood him. She did as he said and hit the target. Iris was surprised that the staff really did breathe fire. Guy asked her not to forget that sensation, and now she must do it again. Iris prepared herself. He knew it might be harder the first time himself. The girl couldn't leave it like this. She is, after all, a dragon. Iris tried to hit the target with her mouth. She reckoned she had succeeded. Gaius didn't think she could do it from her mouth, and she didn't think she could do it the first time. But this way she doesn't see her target at all. As it turned out, Iris missed. She made several more unsuccessful attempts. This made her angry. She decided she wouldn't miss if she came close. Iris destroyed the target. But Gaius said it wasn't target practice. They should just practice magic. Her skills are impressive, but does she realize that she can't hit because she can't see the beam because of her mouth? The girl replies that she is a dragon and it's easier for her. Reiter laughed and thought that the enemy would certainly not expect such a thing. Deus remarked that he was right, they need to make it harder. Therefore, they will continue. The next targets moved. For Iris, they were fast. She tried to hit them. Iris again failed to hit any of them. Gaius realized that the shot was blocking her view, so she'd better try with the staff. The girl gathered herself. If she did, she'd just incinerate them all at once. She decided to just increase her combat power instead of aiming. This was quite the opposite of what he wanted to see. Iris was glad that she had succeeded. And magic is very handy after all. She will call this spell Iris Shot. According to Guy, it's good that she learned how to use magic. 
but he still gives zero points for something like this. The girl didn't understand why. As it turned out, to use that much magic, it was worth learning how to control it to begin with. He doubted that it would hit someone in a real battle. Iris was frustrated, since it was easier for her. Gaius decided to do a little experiment. Guy decided to engage Ryder. He would be her target. That way Guy would be able to gauge his strength too. Ryder was uncomfortable fighting the little girl. The protagonist advised him not to let her appearance fool him. She is, after all, a powerful dragon. The boy didn't think that he could hurt her even after spending all his strength. Reuter didn't realize what kind of monster she was. The girl decided to start. She fired a shot. Reiter was able to dodge and noticed that it was pretty hard. Iris didn't like that. He thought it was too easy. Her actions were easy to read. The girl said it wasn't fair and asked him to stop dodging. Her next blow was simply huge. Let him try to dodge now. Juriel realized that the power of her spell was greater than last time. Not even Reiter would survive from something like this. Iris was afraid that she had overdone it. Gaius was sure he could handle it. When it came to a critical condition, his quick decision-making was second to none. Reiter was glad that his hour had come. He would show himself in all his glory. The guy applied his technique, that is, drifting blades. Next he used the wave cut. The fact that he cut the blade spell and dodged the attack surprised Jiral. The boy knew that magic could also be cut. Iris had not expected such a thing. Guy knew that in reality, things weren't so rosy. An ordinary person wouldn't be able to repeat such a trick. It looks like Ryder is infusing the blade with magic. I wonder if he's doing it consciously. In theory, he's doing the same thing Gaius does when he blocks an opponent's spells. But believe it, he can do such a thing and most likely doesn't realize how it works himself. Now it's his turn. He suddenly pulls out a candy. Ryder threw it to Iris. They like candy. This pleased the girl. He bet that with the candy in her mouth she wouldn't shoot. Guy realized that Ryder had yet to come up with a tactic against Iris to disarm her. Iris wasn't going to spit it out. But she couldn't use magic. Ryder realized that she was caught. The girl suddenly pulled out a staff. Gaius saw that she was passing magic through it. Iris shot out of it. The powerful blow was able to knock Ryder down. Iris realized he was defeated. She was glad she had learned how to use the staff. Iris's shot had reached its limit. Ryder realized that his plan had failed. Gaius didn't think so. On the contrary, he had helped her develop. Since she couldn't open her mouth, she decided to use the staff after all. That's a pretty good way to get her to use it. Gaius wouldn't have thought of such a thing. Reuter didn't think she could do that, so he counted on his victory. Iris turned to Reiter. She inquired if he had any more candy. He held one out to her. Iris was happy, happy to be a member of this group. Gaius concluded, since she had learned how to use magic, their goal for today had been achieved. Gerald was confused about something. Reiter didn't understand what was confusing her. Iris had become even stronger, after all. Beings that dwell in the vastness of space, spirits of blazing stars. They grow stronger in their endless life, taking the power of defeated enemies. Those of them who have defeated countless times surpass even the gods in their knowledge and power. Even Gaius couldn't hurt him. Ryder's mana was almost running out. Guy hadn't expected such a difference between them. There's no time, we'll have to use their trump card. The dark dragon Iris must save this world. The girl suggested asking more respectfully. Gaius asked Mistress Iris to save them. She agreed and struck. The enemy was defeated. No one could equal her. Gaius saw that even now he had nothing to teach her. According to Juriel, they expected nothing less from Iris. Ryder decided to throw a feast for her with sweets. The girl enjoyed them. She mistook it for a large candy. At the time, Ryder thought his plan was good. But she seems to remember him only because she associates him with candy. Iris thought she had a lot of candy. But it was just a dream. How cruel. And Ryder is cruel too. Why wake her up when she's having a beautiful dream? According to him, she bit so hard that she left marks. Jiriel wondered where they were going. Gaius just wanted them to see something. Before their real battle began, he wanted to show them something. The girl recognized the observatory. Guy explained that their magic telescope was very good. And so they would be able to see the power coming from the spirits of the blazing stars. They assumed he was about the spirits of the cosmos. According to Guy, there are many such spirits in the cosmos. Their battles have been going on for more than 1 billion years. This surprised the boys. From here, they can see spirits that are 200,000 light years away from them. The guy offered to take a look. Uriel only saw something shiny. As it turned out, it was the spirits of the blazing stars. In his opinion, it is impressive. He explained that they could see from here 200,000 thousand light years away. That's just a monstrously vast distance. And since they can observe their power from here, does Juriel realize just how enormous it is? The girl replied that a little. Ryder said that if Guy continued to give a boring lecture, Iris would fall asleep again. Guy didn't think she was boring. He didn't understand what she was doing. Ryder explained that she somehow associates him with candy, 
and takes a bite every time she is sleepy. Then he decided to show them in a way that they would understand. Iris did not understand what had happened. The children learned what space looks like. What they could see with the telescope, he simply transferred to their three-dimensional space. Some kind of creature flew by Gerald. She asked what the thing was. As it turned out, it was the spirits of the blazing stars. Gaius had changed the dimensions a bit to make it easier for them to understand. It is now about to engulf the planet, which is about the size of their planet. Juriel was shocked that he had devoured her with one bite. Gaius explained that this was their power. They might find other spirits near their planet, but their power would be no less than this one. The boys realized that there were many spirits. It's only 200,000 light years away from them, which means by the time it reaches them, it will be even stronger, or it could be swallowed up by someone stronger. That's what power means in the cosmos, and he wants to get that kind of power to stand up to them. He and they are on a very different level of understanding of power, and yet, they still have a long way to go to meet them. Reiter thought so too. Without preparation, they have nothing to contend with. Gaius doubted that they could defeat even the weakest spirit now, and the concept of weak is rather stretchy. All the weak ones had long since been swallowed up by the stronger ones. After all, they had been existing and fighting for over a billion years. Therefore, the only way to approach their power is through ultimate magic and nothing else. First, they need to approach the ultimate magic of the Brotherhood of the Blazing Stars. The beyond magic is different from their human magic. The power of the spirits does not disappear even after they die. The Brotherhood was probably able to obtain the corpse of a spirit that once fell on their planet. Then they were able to extract from it the ultimate magic compatible with humans, and seal them into artifacts like the ones he used last time. And since they can put such power into objects, they can mass produce them. In other words, to get the power from an artifact, you have to defeat a smaller version of the spirit sealed inside. If they find the Brotherhood's lair, they can find information about the people who have successfully obtained magic and the very artifacts that they have created. Juriel realized that he just wanted to take them for himself. According to her, the kingdom would have a report for them soon. It would be nice if they could find one of their hideouts somewhere nearby. Gaius was in agreement with her. The king seems to be in his chambers. He suggested going to see him. Reiter inquired how he knew. The guy was using detection magic. Reiter thought that the head of security would faint when he learnt what kind of things he was doing. Using teleportation, Guy apologized for the intrusion and asked permission to enter. The king asked if the lord had found anything he liked in his treasury. Guy replied that he had. There was one thing in there that had to do with forbidden magic. The king was glad to help. Had it not been for his help, his kingdom would have long ago been destroyed by the dragon Limane. But he doesn't want to pay for his help with such a small thing. If he needs anything else, let him just say. Guy only wants information about the forbidden magic. Guy asked if the information about the Brotherhood had been gathered as he had asked. According to the ruler, they are gathering information based on one layer of theirs that they found once. Right now they are verifying the validity of this information. This interested Guy. The king complimented that the lair was. Limane was probably the reason why it had become abandoned. The protagonist inquired what the chances were of finding anything there. The ruler replied that it had simply been wiped clean. Almost no traces were left. Gaius concluded that there were no clues. That is why the king said that they were checking the validity of the information. However, the soldiers sent there never came back. This surprised the boys. It turns out that he thinks that since the soldiers didn't come back, it might be an active lair. Guy decided that they would go there themselves. He asked if the king could tell him where it was. The king handed him a map and asked him to accept it as a token of his gratitude to them. He regretted putting them in such danger, but wanted to pay them in some way for their help. Guy replied that he need not. Guy is quite grateful to him for all the information he has now given him. The team set off on their journey. According to the map, they should be right in front of the lair. Juriel wanted to ask about what the king had said. The dragon Limane appeared at the same time as the discovery of the Brotherhood's destroyed lair. Could it be that Limane was a creation of the Brotherhood? Gaius doubted it. The amount of his forbidden magic was too negligible. Guy thought he had obtained it himself by pure chance. Looks like they've finally arrived. Another 5 kilometers and 20 meters that way. He could feel strange streams of mana from there. Reiter could feel it if he concentrated. But it's so far away, so it's very difficult for him to grasp anything. There was someone's silhouette sitting by the tree. Reuter realized that Guy was right. There is something strange out there. The only thing he could say was that he had a bad feeling about it. Juriel noticed that they were good at hiding. Too good, even. Their mana is too unassuming. And Reiter didn't detect anything at all. Jurel asked how the guys thought they thought they had already spotted them. According to Guy, they are not as weak as they think. They would be stronger than the two of them. That surprised the guys. Reiter was then looking forward to meeting them. From everything Guy could sense, that man is good at fighting. Juriel was surprised by what he already knew how to do. Iris wondered if they would be able to spot her if she used her dragon form to attack. 
Gaius sarcastically replied that they certainly wouldn't notice a huge dragon, better to fight in human form. He wanted her to get used to it. Jiriel doubted that they should go to them at all if they were stronger than them. Gaius considered them an ideal target for practice. It didn't look like they would attack first, because the guys can go say hello. Even though they made the first move now, they don't do anything. He wondered what they were up to. They don't look hostile, but they don't seem friendly either. Had they crossed paths with an honest battle mage? No, then they would definitely do something about it. Juriel turned to Guy. She asked him if he thought it could be people like her that had turned their backs on the organization. Guy wondered. It was true, such a thing was also quite possible. But they would certainly do at least something then. Should they be the first to show their friendliness? Gaius decided to turn to the magician. The protagonist asked what he was doing, and in such a deserted place. The mage replied that he was just hungry, and decided to hunt some edible monsters. Gaius said there were two bull monsters over there. He was thanked. In fact, the monsters are one kilometer away. He has a third marker, and it's great for long-range attacks. Given that, he can kill them right from here without much trouble. Gaius reminded of the fact that the monsters could escape. Wouldn't the mage go out of his way to kill them? According to the mage, humans are very rare in this area. I just didn't recall seeing them before. Gaius didn't feel any hostility. He thought that they had indeed come across a benevolent battle mage. At this time, he cast a spell that was directed towards Guy. Guy managed to dodge it. Because of that, it hit the bird. The animal was torn to pieces. Guy was shocked. Guy realized that it was a spell that ripped the target from the inside, that is, a meat grinder. The mage remarked that he was aware. Such spells were his speciality, and he had dodged it by pure chance. As a combat spell, it carries no utility. But its cruelty is unimaginable, for such pain cannot be endured. Gaius asked who it was. He was told that one cannot answer a question with a question. He was the first to ask. But, it doesn't matter anymore. He would answer them. It was Legimia of the Brotherhood of the Blazing Stars. But they may not remember, for the dead do not need memory. The enemy decided to start with the weakest of them and used a murderous spear of light. The boys were afraid for Iris. She was in pain, by the way. She didn't understand why so suddenly. The enemy was surprised by the defense spell that was able to stop the killing spell. It was unbelievable to Guy, since Iris doesn't use any defense magic. It's just that his spell designed to kill humans lacks the firepower to kill a dragon. The mage didn't think Guy could handle him since he had hired two adventurers of rank 11. Guy assumed that he knew about Jarl and Reiter, or Guy had misunderstood something. The enemy thought he was definitely weaker than him because of the first mark. Gaius felt an inordinate magic emanating from him. It was as if it had penetrated his soul. But what it was, he couldn't answer exactly yet. The opponent said to stop dodging. Maniac specializing in the meat grinder spell. He wondered, had he always been like this or had he been changed by forbidden magic? He decided to check something out and left the mage to the guys. This is just the right opponent to train against. Let them work together and defeat him. Iris should fight in this form. They decided to fight. Iris didn't like fighting in this form. It was uncomfortable for her. The enemy thought the one with the first mark was a joker since he made him an opponent for training. He thought he would send them to another world now. Reuter is always quick to react. Before, he was just raring to go. But now, he must act, coordinating his movements with his allies. The enemy has stopped, waiting for Jural and Reiter's actions. Reiter stopped the enemy with his defensive strike. Jural and Iris will attack from a distance. Pretty good coordination as for a newly formed group. Jural used the meteorite fall and Iris used her flame. There was an explosion. Jural thought they had hit it. Reiter didn't think so. The enemy had used a defense spell. Gaius was sure of it, too. He didn't take any damage. According to the enemy, that girl's magic is quite curious. And the other's spell doesn't belong to a human at all. Since he blocked the attack, he has plenty of experience. Reiter wouldn't train with someone weaker than him. The enemy although he looks quite strong, but inside he is worried about himself. It looks like he was able to block Uriel's spell. Iris, on the other hand, took a lot of mana. What did she want with the dragon? Her spell may look weak, but its combat power is nothing to compare. Making the enemy spend mana on defense is a pretty reasonable tactic for them. Although Gaius didn't think they'd be able to do it for long. Most likely the enemy would just change their tactics soon. The enemy decided to play around with them. The holder of the third mark wants to cross swords with the fourth mark. Gaius thought it was just a provocation. Reiter thought it would be fun, so he decided to cheer up the enemy. The battle mage called him a fool and used a ball of lightning. Reiter didn't expect this. Gaius knew that a ball of lightning is an electric type spell. It is not weak, but it is not strong enough to kill Reiter. Its negative effect is paralysis, and any movement in close combat solves everything. The enemy has struck a wreather. The enemy used a ball of lightning. Reiter didn't expect that. 
the guy realized what he was trying to do. Aeus figured this spell was too weak to kill Ryder, but enough to paralyze him. In close combat, every second counts. The enemy has struck Ryder. Everyone was afraid for him. The enemy thought he had won. At this time Ryder had time to recover and almost hit the enemy with his sword, but he dodged. It was close. This shocked Iris. Ural explained that it was one of his strategies. He has healing runes all over his body. If the wound isn't fatal, he definitely won't die. But instead of runes, one could also use sigils. Gaius noticed that even the apparent panic on his face was part of a plan to deceive the enemy. The protagonist hadn't expected that he was so good at battle planning. In any case, the enemy had dodged and wouldn't fall into such a trap a second time, especially since Ryder had used too much mana to treat that wound. He realized that most people were not as cautious as the enemy. At the moment, they had one victory and one defeat. The enemy spent a decent amount of mana to defend against Iris's flames, then engaged in a battle with Ryder, all to prevent Iris from shooting her own ally. In a mage battle, reducing the opponent's mana is normal. Whoever runs out of mana first loses. Depleting the enemy with Iris's spell was the best plan, but Gaius doubted that it would work the second time. Now the question was who would strike first. The enemy would not fall for it a second time. He used a ball of lightning. Guy thought that even if Ryder tried to pull such a trick a second time, the enemy already knew his moves in advance. There was nothing wrong with a second attempt, but Ryder is not a fool. Gaius realized that Ryder could fill his weapon with magic to stop the spell. It turns out that the first time he caught the lightning on purpose, the opponent didn't know about it. But still, letting the enemy attack first isn't the best move. Or maybe he has some new plan after all. Since that's the case, the enemy suggested to just slash each other right here and now. And he was beginning to amuse Ryder. The two faced off again. Iris told Gerald that she could help, but then she would hit Ryder. She didn't know what to do. The girl thought if Ryder didn't get the advantage, then she will use her magic. They have no other choice. Even if Iris did hit Ryder, he wouldn't die, but for the damage, Guy doesn't know anything. It's dangerous to make such a move in this situation. They want to help him, but they don't know how. Ryder was confident that he would win this battle. He made a strong move. It didn't break the opponent who used a ball of lightning and hit Ryder. Gaius knew that Jurel and Ryder were far from weak, but all their battle experience is only aimed at monsters. Looking at their fight, one can realize that they are trying to resolve everything with one strong strike. Such attacks are effective against monsters with a lot of health, but when the opponent has his own fighting style, it all becomes meaningless. Their own enemy, on the other hand, specializes in much less striking power. It doesn't matter if he's an assassin or what, but he's an expert at fighting humans. For Ryder, this is the worst possible outcome. Although he's saving mana now in close combat by fending off Ryder's attacks with his sword, but at the opportune moment, he'll strike with magic, and Ryder spends quite a bit of mana on each of his strikes. At this rate, Ryder will soon run out of mana. The fourth mark is very good, but in this case, the advantage is on his side. Gaius hoped he realizes it perfectly well himself. The opponent offered to surrender and die quickly. He doesn't stand a chance against him. He decided to kill him in the safest way possible. Ryder told him to shut up. He used a double wave cut. The opponent asked how one could not understand simple things. Ryder did not realize that he would be too vulnerable after his attack. He was aiming straight for the neck. Ryder wouldn't have time to dodge. If he was decapitated, he wouldn't have time to activate the healing. This wasn't good. Juriel applied a ball of lightning. It saved Ryder. The opponent was angry as he was almost done with him. The guy thanked Urel. He owed her a debt of gratitude. The girl told him not to think of trying to kill him with one blow. This is a thinking man after all, not a stupid monster. Gaius wondered if he could change his fighting style now. Ryder responded that he actually understood. The protagonist noticed that he had invested much less mana, but his attacks are still just as useless against him. The opponent realized that Ryder had now made the wrong lunge that he had planned. He was able to trick him. The less mana he uses, the more often he can cast spells. The guy asked what it was like for him to fight against the fourth mark. Ryder understood everything. His thinking ability before critical moments is amazing. The easiest option for fourth marks to defeat an opponent is to wreck him with a barrage of fast, his weakest attacks. Ryder continued to be successful. According to the enemy, it would be impossible for the fellow to defeat him with his cheap tricks. Juriel reminded himself that there are they. He won't be able to get away. The opponent thought it was funny. Yes, they have always fought against monsters, so they have no experience in dueling with humans. But they know their business. Juriel applied a ball of lightning. The speed of her spells was astonishing. He realized that she had prepared them in advance. They want to defeat their opponent with their own tactics. Ryder was about to strike again. The enemy asked not to underestimate him. Suddenly a large rock appeared in front of him. It had been tossed by Iris. It was amusing and quite good. 
Picking them up is just as problematic, but with her strength it's not a problem. Ryder suggested to stop being distracted. He used his sword technique, cross flash. Ryder was able to hit the opponent. The boys were pleased that they had succeeded. Considering that they had only relied on brute force before, it was rather surprising that they were able to consider their mistakes and develop a battle plan against him. After all, a real fight is much better than just training. Except there's still more. Ryder thought it was over. Putting up his sword, he forced to speak everything the enemy knew about the Brotherhood of the Blazing Stars. The enemy grinned. They are indeed very amusing. How did they not realize it was a trap yet? He applied the bonds of darkness. He hid his wounds. So Ryder's plan has turned against himself. It's a stealth spell that activates when you cast it. But it's not particularly powerful. As a result, the boys were blinded. Everything went as he had planned. But judging by the more mana spent on Iris, she's the one he fears the most. He really is a good killer. It's been a long time since the opponent fought like this. For his wasted time, he'll send them all to hell. It was a fiery explosion. Long time in preparation, consumes a lot of mana, but a dangerous and powerful spell. Perfect to finish off the enemy. The enemy told them to say goodbye to their lives. He used a fire blast. Such an attack cannot be avoided. It seemed to help the enemy win. He thought, although it was difficult to fight with the 11th rank, but in the end, it was business as usual. They weren't even helped by that guy's leadership. People would never become stronger under someone else. The enemy remembered him and wondered where he was when he suddenly noticed the magic. Guy created a barrier and praised the boys. This infuriated the enemy, for some mage out there with a measly first mark was able to block his fire blast. The guys were very sorry that they had lost to one person. Iris's eyes were still watery and she couldn't see anything. Guy explained that it was because they just didn't have enough experience, that's all. Battles with humans and monsters are very different. According to Juriel, although there were three of them, it was mostly Ryder who did all the work. They hardly ever worked as a group. Gaius replied that even just realizing their mistakes was already considered excellent training. The enemy turned to them. He asked how they could talk as if they had defeated him and decided to attack again. Guy asked the boys not to worry. He would take it up with her next. What surprised him was that Guy was only using one light sword. Looks like he really is the weakest among them. So the fact that his barrier withstood the explosion was just luck. Gerald was embarrassed by his sword. Deus decided that he would only use spells of their level. Otherwise, it wouldn't be training. The opponent didn't understand what nonsense he was talking about. The protagonist was surprised that he hadn't realized yet. Gaius was just weakening himself to fight him normally. The enemy asked who he even thought he was. Who allowed a weakling like him to command here? Yes, Guy's spells may be weak, but his technique is impeccable. If something is not to his liking, then let him show him what real combat is and he will remove the restraints. The enemy understood him at once. He was the first to strike. Jiriel was worried about Guy. Guy realized that it was a shadow strike, but the improved version of the Bond of Darkness he used on them. Even though he is arrogant, he tried to kill him before he could do anything. He is an excellent assassin. Gaius said it was a good strike from below. The enemy noticed that he was keeping his guard up. The enemy thought mages with the first mark could only survive by running away from the battlefield all the time. Gaius would have loved to fight him in a one-on-one -on -one battle. But alas, it's only training. Therefore, he won't let them just watch. Juriel asked what the plan is now. According to Gaius, she and Iris are wearing spells. Ryder let them ignore their spells, just attack. That way they'll finish the whole thing in one go. The guys didn't expect this. Gerald should use the meteorite fall, Iris her flame, and Ryder will just attack. Guy offered to show what victory means. Gerald asked if he was sure. Guy realized that she doubted their victory. And so it turned out. After all, that was how they had acted before. If Ryder now went into melee again, Iris and she would not be able to use spells without hurting him. The point is that Ryder was fighting alone then. Accordingly, their combat power would decrease. If he could step back for a while so that they could attack, then they would have that chance. Guy asked if she thought his strategy was a losing strategy. The girl replied that she just wasn't sure. According to Guy, if they focused on the number of attacks, they would become weaker and it would be easier for the enemy to defend against them. Which means he will easily pick the moment to attack, and will hit with some strong spell himself. Now, with all this in mind, what's the best plan? Jiriel thought for a moment. He asked Iris that. She suggested killing him. Gaius replied that he was staying out of their battle. The best plan for them now would be to use Iris's flame. It can destroy magic and it's hard to block. Because of it, the enemy will spend a lot of mana on their defense against it. Therefore, he should be prevented from doing so. But the enemy can just dodge. The guy asked Iris how to do it. She thought Ryder should do her best to take the blows. He asked indignantly what evil he had done to her. Guy turned to Iris. She was frightened and apologized. As it turned out, it was the right thing to do. The girl was surprised that he praised her. 
Guy simply said that her answer was correct. Iris rejoiced. Reuter thought Guy was lying. He suggested that he explain himself. Gaius decided that showing would be easier than explaining. Besides, Legimia was already waiting for them. Have they finished their negotiations there? The day will soon be over. And anyway, do they think they can beat him if the guy with the first mark joins them? If I were him, Guy would keep his guard up. Yes, he can only use basic spells, but he's also dispelling the spell that Legimia is trying to cast all the time right now. The enemy has noticed that he is very observant. Great, then. He reckons he doesn't need to hold back anymore. The team has prepared for battle. Riyadh realized that he just needed to always distract him, while Iris and Jiral would hit him with spells. It turns out that even if he got hit by their spells, he would still need to stand until he won. Deus replied that he had generally got it right. They won't hurt him. You don't have to worry about that, just let him believe him. Everyone was surprised. Reuters is likely to be the one to deliver the final blow. As the protagonist said, he should ignore their spells and fight to the fullest. Reiter didn't quite understand him. But if that's what he says, then that's what he should do. He gathered his strength. The two men clashed. It seemed to the opponent that he had grown stronger. Reuter didn't know, but this time Legimia would definitely die. Gaius told Iris and Jiral to start. The girls were worried if Reiter would be okay. Gaius asked them not to worry. Then they entered the battle. They used the meteorite fall and Iris's flame. Legimia did not expect such a thing. They decided to sacrifice their partner to defeat him. He realized that he should rather erect a barrier. Reiter prevented him. The enemy replied that he too would die without it. Reiter knew nothing. He was told only to hinder him and that he was in no danger. Legimia realized what would happen if this continued. Reiter saw his fear. The opponent's blow had no effect on the lad. He remained unharmed, which surprised the enemy. He did not realize what was happening. Suddenly Legimia noticed something. He thought they had put a barrier on him. But no, it wasn't Reiter who did it, it was the guy with the first mark. The enemy figured such a simple barrier wasn't enough to stop their spells anyway. He noticed the new barrier. Legimia realized that Gaius was updating his barrier each time. It was hard to believe that he wasn't even slowing down in spell creation and still raising so many defensive barriers. The first marks are really slow. That guy shouldn't have been able to do that. It's not as hard as it seems at first glance if you can predict the outcome of a fight. Given that Gaius had even seen the enemy fight, I didn't think he would somehow change or use new skills. The enemy thought it was rubbish. It's impossible to predict a fight with such accuracy. No way in his life would he believe it. According to Reuter, it may be impossible, but he can do it. And here's Legimia. His wounds have begun to slow him down. Reiter struck next. That finished off the enemy. They did it. Reiter had a mixed feeling. He didn't think it was so easy to predict. It was about time to finish him off. The opponent wasn't going to die so easily. Reiter's sword technique and cross flash were used. The enemy was defeated. There was a large explosion. The girls were frightened for Reiter. Guy reassured them that he was alive. Guy was right. He wasn't even scratched. And Jural and Iris had just used only one spell each. Jural asked if he knew from the beginning that it would end this way. Reiter wondered if Gaius had really been able to predict all this. It turned out he had. He had already seen them fight. He understood their attacks and their actions. And the rest of it wasn't that hard to predict. In response to Ural's question, he replied that he had indeed prepared a bunch of barriers in advance, knowing that. Analyzing one's combat capabilities is very important. If they know the capabilities of their allies and observe the enemy well in battle, even such simple spells will be of great value. He would like Juriel to take on this role. The girl didn't think she would ever be able to do as well as Gaius. Guy was sure it was because she just didn't have much combat experience yet, especially since he wasn't talking about now, just plans for the future. Since Reiter has a fourth marker, his speciality is close combat. That's why he advised him to specialize in it. Next is Iris. Since she is a dragon, she is not good for complex spells. The girl realized that she would need to use simple and strong spells. She did. But if she studied the theory of magic and was able to control her mana better, then they could use stronger spells. This surprised Iris. Gaius suggested that she try to study well like that for at least a month. The girl didn't understand what good study meant. He meant spending all day studying, except for bedtime. And yes, she would be allowed to eat while studying. Speaking of magic theory, Reiter knows and understands it better than all three of them. His sword technique doesn't just rely on strength. Apparently, he created it based on the principles of magic. The same goes for his runes on his body. They're made well, but they're made based on theories that are considered old. He's also pretty good at paperwork. Though you can't tell from him, he looks like a real scholar. Iris was glad that they had finally won and was about to go home. Because she was starving. Gaius didn't know what she meant, they had just started. Jiral explained that they had come here to find the Brotherhood's lair, and to take their magic. All their other habitats are abandoned. This is the only place they even had a man to guard for, 
which the three of them couldn't defeat the first time. It seemed to him that the entrance must be here somewhere. Iris couldn't see anything, but she felt that there was something here. It's hard for Reiter to tell. Gaius didn't sense any concealment spells, probably the entrance must be underground. They'll try a detection spell now, and then see if they see something or not. Gaius used the spell. Jiriel was surprised that such a big place was under their feet the whole time. The protagonist surmised that the lair was made under buildings that had been here before. Now that the entrance had been found, the rest was up to Reiter. He helped free it. They went down inside. The place where Jiriel was looked like this. Only the top brass had access to the underground facilities. Reiter could not sense the presence of anyone alive here. Gaius was in agreement. The detection spell didn't find anyone either. That pleased Iris. Then there was nothing to fear. It turned out to be a trap that hit Iris and pinned her against the wall. They were afraid for her. Iris turned to Jural. According to her, it would have been much better if they had told her about them beforehand. Jural apologized. Iris asked not to worry since she is a dragon, but it's still a little unpleasant. Gaius realized that whoever had set them up had certainly not counted on the dragon. It turns out this whole path is full of traps, despite all its appearance. For their safety, Gaius will first put up a barrier before they continue on their way. The presence of a large number of traps is confirmed. Reuter thought although there are plenty of traps here, they can be dealt with without magic. Jeriel agreed with him. They look a lot easier than the fight they put upstairs. It's rather odd to think that traps are the main purpose here, considering they left an assassin upstairs. They're only designed to slow them down. They came in and realized there was a barrier in front of them. They explore the Brotherhood's lair. At the end of a corridor full of traps, they find a door with a barrier. It seems like it should protect something valuable, but Guy's gut tells him it isn't. If they want to break it down, Reiter can help. Gerald doubted that it was all exactly for protection against intruders. Iris wondered what was behind that door. She hoped there was treasure or food in there, but Guy noticed that the door didn't look like a vault. Reiter suggested that he kick the door open. Guy stopped him and replied that by no means. It was too fragile for a barrier. Guy suggested that it might also be a trap. There is some very strange magic on the barrier. Jiriel thought it was a curse. Gaius was sure it didn't look like one. But if it was, then there must be a device here that was attuned to such magic. He would try to find out now and ask them to wait. Guy used the magic detection. The spell found the object. According to him, there is a mana compression device down there. Jiriel was surprised that he could smell it from such a weak mana flow. These kinds of traps are very common in places like this. If the magical connection between the door and the device is broken, the trap will trigger and blow up the place. Iris was upset that they would then say goodbye to all the sweets inside. Gaius replied that the trap had already been triggered. It would be about 10 minutes before the explosion. Reiter inquired exactly how it had triggered. They hadn't even laid a finger on the door yet. According to Guy, because of that killer upstairs. Looks like that device is getting another signal from outside and they just cut it off. The guys realized they had to get out of here as soon as possible. Jiralee asked how they could escape if they had about 10 minutes. According to Iris, she could turn into a dragon, and they would all fly on her back. Jiral praised her for the idea. Gaius wanted to speak up. Jiriel wondered what was wrong. He suggested using magic since they needed to leave quickly. Iris seconded him. Jiriel apologized. He just seemed so calm from that moment, she didn't think he wanted to run. Gaius apologized. He just thought since they had about 10 minutes, there was no need to rush anywhere. Iris didn't expect to fall out of the portal and screamed. As it turned out, Guy had created a barrier. Gerald did not realize where they were. Iris asked her to look over there. In front of them they saw the entrance to the lair. Gerald asked indignantly why he had teleported them here. They were supposed to get far away from this place. The guy replied that it was fine. He wouldn't let anything explode. This place is a valuable source about the Brotherhood. There should definitely be a lot of clues about them and their work. Ural thought, he'll break it and teleport it away. The protagonist used the excavation's protective barrier. The spell resulted in a lot of birds, which the guys didn't expect. They got busy digging. Riaida realized that they were dismantling the earth. Jiriel noticed what they were pecking at was disappearing. She surmised that they were preserving them. It turned out to be so. This is the magic of storage. Items are taken apart, placed in a special space, and reassembled there. But it's very mana-intensive. Jiriel understood, even though he makes it sound like it's so simple, but in reality, Gaius explained that they could stop or break the device, but then the lair would have to suffer a lot, and if they lost the information, they would be left with nothing. Jiriel had never thought that storage magic could be used like this. Riaida remarked that it was good to keep things in places other than pockets. They got to the device. It was about five minutes away from exploding. The team approached the device. Jiriel realized what it looked like. Iris realized that the magic inside seemed very dark and unpleasant. 
Riata remembered that it was similar to the one Gaius had shown them in the treasury. A fusion of primordial magic. It was. Only there, he was in control. This one's already set to explode. Gaius suggested we disarm it. If you let the magic out carefully, the device won't explode. This device is built with extreme precision. It does not appear to have been designed to blow up this place at all. It may have originally been used for other purposes where something is required of primordial magic. Gaius asked if Jural had ever seen something similar. The girl thought, yes, it happened once. It was probably in the lair where she was. It was made to squeeze out primordial magic and run it through one's body. It was supposed to affect the soul and make the wearer stronger. At least that was all she had heard at the time. Very briefly, devices of this type were designed to inject primal magic into a person's soul. It would give great power for a time, but would severely distort the soul and personality. Gaius noticed that she was well informed. The members of the Brotherhood have figured out how to make them stronger. Juriel surmised that this was once one of his experiments. As it turned out, Guy's experiments are built on other methods. Forbidden magic also affects the soul. This device and forbidden magic are similar in some ways. He asked what she thought would happen if she used forbidden magic on an already corrupted soul. Juriel couldn't even imagine. She thought the soul wouldn't be able to withstand. But what if he said that forbidden magic could compensate for all the soul's flaws? There was a good chance that if it was successfully absorbed, one could become stronger. Iris turned to Reiter. According to her, when she sneezes, she can accidentally release her flame. He asked if she was serious now. If she sneezed now, she might release Iris's flame. Reuter was afraid. They didn't need Iris's flame right now. She didn't let him finish by sneezing, releasing a flame that headed straight for the device. It was a surprise to everyone. Gaius and Jarl used barriers. Gaius was not pleased. Iris felt ashamed and apologized a lot. There seemed to be nothing wrong with the device. She gave him a fright. He never thought that Iris's flame would have such a flaw. The device broke unexpectedly. Iris cried out in terror. Jarl realized that the mana from the device was spiraling out of control. Reiter had seen too much mana. It was not good for the good. The beyond magic continued to come out. Jarl would try to seal it with a barrier. She was unsuccessful in holding it back as the pressure is too strong. Even though she adds more layers of defense, mana still breaks through no matter what. Jiriel struggled to hold the barrier. The overpowered force was more powerful than her, it was out of control. One must retreat. Gaius thanked Jiriel for slowing her down. It had helped a great deal. The rest is up to him. The girl didn't understand what he was up to. She surmised that Gaius wanted to squeeze mana with outlandish magic. He replied that that was exactly what he was doing. If he could shrink the mana and regain control of it, he would bring the device back to normal. The fusion absorbed all the mana. As a result, the inhibitive mana disappeared. He was able to rebalance the device. If he returned the original mana here and repaired the device, it could be used again. Jiriel would never have thought that it could be controlled. Gaius replied that he had already done it once, after all. Without that experience he would have had a bit of a hard time. Iris was very sorry. She promised to be more careful. Guy turned to her. He asked if she now understood why it was important to control her own magic. She should study hard to keep her mana under control. Iris promised to do her best. Gaius was counting on her. In any case, what had just happened had nothing to do with Iris's fire. The device had simply broken down on its own. Gaius thought it was time to finish digging and suggested we go see what was inside. They explored the things left over from the fraternity. Jarl said that they had even used detection magic, but they hadn't found anything useful. Iris was upset that there was no food or treasure. Reiter thought this burnt piece of something could have been some kind of document, but it was completely burned, alas. If it had turned to ashes, Guy would have been able to recover it, but these ashes are so fine that they cannot be recovered. Jiriel was surprised that he could recover things from ashes as well. All that's left here is just rubbish. The Brotherhood is leaving their havens more thoroughly than he thought. The only thing left here is a mana compression device. Considering the abilities of the assassin guarding the base, one can see that the explosion was not part of their plan. The assassin's abilities were much stronger than the strength of the two rank 11 adventurers and the dark dragon combined. We can assume that his defeat is simply one possible fraternity calculation. Had he not been killed, they would soon have taken the device and conducted their experiments elsewhere. Reiter observed that this was true. If you look at the way the traps are set up, it all adds up in your mind. Personally, Juriel didn't think the device would give them any information about other safe havens. Deus didn't think so either. This device is needed to conduct experiments on souls. The beyond magic that the Brotherhood has been researching is aimed at investigating the power of the soul. As he said before, the soul can be distorted by compressed mana. If the fusion of such mana is successful, one can become stronger, but the chance of your soul and personality being broken is also great. However, souls distorted in this way already react differently to such magic. 
If the Brotherhood really did conduct some experiments with this device, they will also conduct it and create a special distorted soul. That way, they can seek out their hideouts based on such a soul's reaction to the distortion of mana around it. But there are no guarantees about this. Reiter contemplated finding them by this method. He surmised that they had thought through that option as well. And about the experiment, Guy asked if he was thinking of conducting it on a living creature. Iris thought they meant to say that she should take responsibility and volunteer to go because she had caused them a lot of trouble. Gaius explained that Iris is a dragon, her soul is different from a human's. He took care of everything beforehand and asked her to calm down. Iris felt relieved. There's a better option. The guy was also doing soul research, after all. This thing replicates the soul of a human, but is created by magic. It's called a pseudo-soul. He suggested trying to use a device on this thing. Reiter could not even imagine how a soul could be created with magic. It took Gaius a great deal of effort and resources to create it, but better that than using a human. From what it says here, the degree of compression should be just that. If they follow this instruction, they will get the same characteristics as other shelters. Magic has worked on the soul. As a result, the soul disappeared. Juriel thought that the experiment had failed. Mana injection by a special mana compression device into the pseudo-soul of a person created by magic. If they can recreate the unique distortions of this device, they can find other sanctuaries of the Brotherhood. It would seem that the experiment has failed. It turned out to be the opposite. This is the core of the pseudo-soul. All they needed was the magical distortion caused by the device. And they got it. Now they just need to find the exact same distortion. The guys aren't quite sure what the principle behind all this is or how they're going to find the distortion. Guy decided to use familiars. He made them with just the ability to search for exactly the same soul distortion. First, have them search the kingdom and surrounding areas. Even his search methods were drastically different from the conventional ones. He didn't think they would be this close, so he would have to wait. Guy offered to eat while they waited. This lunch is over reading a book on the theory of magic. Iris promised to try her best. Guy asked about the progress of reading the magic theory book he gave them. The guys could tell if there was something they didn't understand. Reuter replied that so far, nothing much. The book is quite difficult, but it begins to make sense when you study the material carefully. The book he has in his hands is a compilation of the most recent theories of magic. Not only does he understand the differences between traditional magic, but he explores all. Juriel asked about a detailed explanation of this book. Gaius explained that this book includes compilations of magic written a couple of hundred years ago. There are no theoretical errors in it, it is the best book of its kind. Juriel noticed that it says about the power of spells. It says that it has already reached its limit and cannot be higher, but its power surpasses everything written about it in this book. Gaius asked me to read it carefully. It should describe everything below. The girl found the amount of mana that you can pour into a spell and recreate. According to the protagonist, that means that used to be the limit. Magic is rapidly advancing. And as new theories emerge, the old ones no longer make sense. Juriel understood. She used to think practice was more important, but she thinks theory is also very much needed. It will be a bit difficult to learn it all and put it into practice. Gaius asked how Iris was doing. She is now reading the third page. This surprise guy, with the first one being the cover and the second being the table of contents. According to her, this book is complicated. She was reading Introduction to Magic for Beginners, Royal Academy of Sidonia, for students in the first grade of primary schools. Gaius didn't know there was a school that taught magic to those who had only gone to first grade. Reiter explained that it was the textbook of a prestigious academy. He wouldn't say it's very easy there either. The protagonist thought that if it was for first graders, there should be just as much text for kids her age. Suddenly the birds came to them. The familiars had returned, faster than he had thought. Gaius unfolded the map. The bird pointed to a spot. There's a reaction right there. Reuter remembered that there hadn't been anything there for at least a hundred years. This is the kingdom of Orden, sort of like a state, but at the same time it's not. Gaius realized he meant to say that they have a name, but the state itself has been gone for a long time. It was named so by a band of brigands. This place is the worst in the world. Information about them doesn't go beyond their state, so he can't say what it's like there now. Gaius realized that this was to their advantage. Jiriel asked why. Guy explained that if they destroyed everything there, there would be no international scandal. Jiriel assumed that was the case. You can't have neighboring states intervening. Ryder realized that he was determined to wipe everything out there. The kingdom of Sidonia is nearby. This gorge is the border. Jiriel wondered if Gaius knew the place. He asked why she thought so. The girl simply surmised. Gaius thought maybe he had fought there in the past. He wondered if there had always been a gorge there. Juriel couldn't say for sure, but it was said to have been created by Gaius' attack magic. That's why it's called the Twelfth Gorge of Gaia. He thought he was being a little over the top, so he asked why the Twelfth. 
Are there 11 others like it? Turns out there are, and many places are named in his honor. Since there are guys gorge 1 through 12, it would be a little hard to remember everything. He reflected on the fact that there might be 13 or more. Reuters said it was the most common name in the world, in case he didn't know. Gaia Gorge. Gerald began to list the Gaia Reservoir, the Gaia Plain. Gaius didn't understand why they used random people's names to name something. Reiter asked if it was because Guy was involved in all these places. He had heard that 200 years ago the protagonist had embarrassed cartographers with his adventures. Iris inquired who his enemy was back then. Guy thought, taking the period of 200 years ago, a dragon. That's what she knew. He felt sorry for the cartographers. His magic had caused them trouble. He would try to use it more carefully from now on. He decided to continue. According to him, there is a slight possibility that there is a brotherhood hideout there. Gerald suggested that they should take over the kingdom. Reiter was in agreement. He wanted to make it the 13th Gorge of Gaia. Gerald thought such a thing already existed. They entered the portal. Reiter couldn't believe that this was the kingdom of Orton. He saw nothing but farmland. Gaius explained that the teleportation ban was being used here. They were now about 5 kilometers from the city center. He wanted to make a surprise attack, but plans changed. Gaius suggested getting closer using stealth magic. It was fairly quiet. Reiter noticed that they looked like settlers looking for land. He didn't even know how to describe them normally. Guy asked if he was sure he thought the Brotherhood's safe haven was around here somewhere. Guy noticed that they wouldn't just put teleportation like that, so they must want to hide something. They heard a harsh voice ordering them not to relax. One man was beating his slave for working. Since he doesn't want to work, he will become fertilizer. Reiter took back his words, it's not so quiet here. Juriel realized that slave labor reigned here. Those who are working now may well be kidnapped people as well. Gaius realized, she wanted to say, that they could just as well be migrants, but they had been taken over by the Brotherhood. Iris asked permission to beat him up. She would not allow the people who invented sweets to be bullied. It was explained to her that killing him would blow their cover. Better to just put him to sleep. He was just about to strike the slave, but thanks to Guy's magic, he fell asleep in time. If it really is the Brotherhood, they will free them by destroying the hideout. The boys approached the castle. Reiter asked if it was really the place the familiar had pointed out to him. And is there a person inside whose soul is distorted by the same device? Gaius thought there could be no mistake. The two people guarding the gate are battle mages, and very strong battle mages. Therefore, their disguises will no longer work. Iris asked what they would do. According to Guy, it's already clear what. They will declare war on them. Gaius used the teleportation lock. Juriel assumed that he had used it. Guy replied that he had. Exactly the same one that was at the entrance to the kingdom. Only it forbids him to teleport outward instead of inward. Their purpose is to gather information. And to make sure no one escapes, we have to cut off all escape routes. Uriel understood what he meant. There are underground passages in this hideout too, and he included them in the spell's area of effect as well. The guards realized that they were the ones who made the barrier. They announced an enemy attack. The magicians were going to kill them all. Reiter wondered if they were serious about just coming in and killing them. What about finding out the reason for the attack? Juriel explained that the Brotherhood was not with good intentions from the beginning. They were used to such attacks. The members used a thunderball, an ice blast, and a flaming arrow. Reiter decided to take them on. He used Reiter's sword technique and lightning strike. He cut their magic. Gaius noticed that Reiter dispelled their magic with a single blow. This is what happens when the difference in strength is great. The opponents realized that it was a rank 11 swordsman and they needed to retreat. Gaius was very much surprised. By giving the order to retreat, it means they are guarding their information very carefully. Gerald won't let them leave so easily. The members of the Brotherhood have seen ranged magic. Iris will not forgive those who mock the people who make sweets. They used the meteorite fall and the flames of Iris. Reiter asked if they were sure they were restraining their powers. Give them another minute and they would have left no stone unturned. Gaius has asked to take them prisoner if possible. He would appreciate any information. If Gerald's situation allows it, it will do. But he should know that suicide is part of fraternity policy. Reiter did not expect them all to be willing to kill themselves. Gerald explained that they have been brainwashed and deprived of their own will. Their very existence is merely to obey the rules. Guy concluded that if they knew they could not escape, they would kill themselves. Then the boys would prepare in advance, so they wouldn't destroy anything. Juriel suggested that it was a meteorite fall. Guy replied that it was, but he rewrote the formula, and reworked it a bit. The spell reached the surface. Juriel thought he was using freezing magic. Turns out he wasn't. It was just that Gaius had made the falling meteor freeze the sight of the meteor. Ice blocks appeared on the surface. When people and things are frozen, they're easier to damage and break. Iris was getting chilly. Reiter explained that she just didn't have much muscle. Gaius noticed enemy transmission magic. It looked like the enemy had decided to use transmission magic. 
Burial was surprised that transmission communication was for them. It turned out not to be so, Gaius just intercepted the signal. Negotiation is also information after all. It asked if all the materials were classified. A reply was received which confirmed this and added that, if anything, leaks were minimized. Jirio realized that meant someone was still alive after all. Gaius thought so too. They were able to block the freeze, and for that matter, they are quite strong and competent. Their professionalism won't allow them to use the transmission so carelessly, so their message is a simple trap. Gaius has found more guys downstairs with magic, but their strength is much higher than the ones now. There's someone else with distorted mana. Perhaps it is the one they are looking for. The guys asked what they would do. Gaius offered to accept their invitation. Right here, there's a passage. They set off to meet their opponents. Everything inside was frozen. Even the floor was frozen and slippery. Iris said that if they could skate well on ice, they could safely do as she did. Guy wondered how she would break. Iris lost control. She fell and a trap went off in her direction. Juriel was afraid for her. Iris was in pain. Attacking without warning is the act of a coward. Gaius realized that she had swooped right into their trap. He asked if she was really in that much pain. The girl replied that it didn't hurt that much, but it was still unpleasant. The enemies were surprised that she was still alive despite the direct hit and assumed it was a protective barrier. Gaius turned to them. The trap didn't work, did it. Then he hoped they have the classified material with them. The leader thought they had come for information. He suggested he try to get it from him himself, but let them consider if they don't beat them all, they won't get anything. Gaius surmised, there are about 50 opponents here. If the odds are not in their favor, they will burn any material and information, or might do so. Guy decided, since it wouldn't give, he'd take it himself. Guy used item movement. He took the information. The opponents didn't expect that such a defense barrier could be broken so easily, and he uses such a strong object movement along with breaking the barrier. Gaius didn't see it as a big deal. They were just too weak. It made the enemies angry. The order was given to kill them. As the overseer of this asylum, he allowed them to use the demigod form. The enemies prepared for battle. The guys noticed a frightening mana that looked familiar. There could be no mistake. It's a forbidding magic. Guy wanted to learn more and more about them. The enemies were preparing to attack. Jiral felt a strong increase in mana. Reiter asked Guy if this was normal. Guy thought they wanted to increase their power through out-of-bounds magic and suggested to watch. The enemies were filled with magic. They were full of anger. Iris's opponents resembled demons. This surprised the guys. In this world, there are creatures called demons. Although they look like humans, but their thinking is different. They are completely hostile to others and their origin is still unknown. Juriel surmised what causes demons to appear. Gaius didn't know. They were a little different from all the demons he had fought before. It would be necessary to find traces of forbidden magic here. Reuter thought, in any case, to search, you'd have to calm them all down first. But there are quite a few of them here. It's commendable to the Watcher that they didn't escape. One of the participants was swallowed up. Gaius knew that forbidden magic to increase power alters the soul. Apparently, this guy's soul couldn't take it. Reuter noticed that he continued to change. Juriel wondered what would happen to him next. According to him, what she was thinking. He thought she knew more. The magic had completely taken hold of him. He had turned into a demon. The ultimate magic merged with his soul. I guess that's how demons are made after all. Uriel was right. It seemed to the girl that now was not the time to ponder. Gaius agreed. But despite his appearance, he wasn't very strong. That surprised her. The demon became furious. It seems when you can't keep your mind when you transform. Then what's the point of this action if it ends up attacking allies? Though Gaius thought it could be put down to the difficulty of using forbidden magic, Juriel offered to return from her musings to them. The enemy thought, this is a failure again. Gaius turned his attention to the claws. He wields forbidden magic to alter and betray form. The Watcher used magic on the demon. He killed it with a single blow. Even though he was an ally, it made sense to Gaius. So, with soul distortion, you can change your body. So that's how they use the ultimate magic. The Watcher apologized for keeping them waiting. Gaius replied that it was nothing. In return, he showed him something very interesting. But what now? Will he show his abilities in battle? Gaius couldn't wait. The enemy noticed that they wanted it so badly. Juriel turned to him. He is strong, but the number of opponents. Gaius asked not to worry, he dispelled their barrier. If the enemies are stronger, they will escape. Riata remarked that he is prudent. The lookout said that since they were looking forward to fighting him, they were completely mad with fear. Since that was the case, there was nothing to be done. He will make them pay for invading this place. He failed to break through the barrier that is contentedly strong. Gaius thought the opponent was stronger. He asked not to look down on him. Looking down was able to break through his barrier just a little, even though after so much time. The enemy ordered an attack. They all pounced on the barrier. Gaius noticed that it wasn't bad. The watcher wondered how long his composure would last. 
Juriel asked him to increase the barrier. Guy wondered why. He admitted that he was frustrated. The boys did not understand why. Guy had always thought of forbidden magic as a tool that could amplify magic, but they're just using it as a weapon. Not that it was bad, but if that was their maximum level of amplification, then normal magic would be even better. Ryder concluded that he was frustrated because their enemies were weak. This turned out to be the case. Gaius, after all, had had high expectations for forbidden magic from the beginning. Juriel didn't think this was the time for discussion. Iris remembered that he had such magic too, after all, and asked why he couldn't become stronger than them. Gaius had forgotten about it. Then, he wanted to try to imitate them. He repeated their spell. It shocked his opponents. Ryder worried whether Guy would then become normal. Guy replied that he would especially since it would be very uncomfortable for him to use that arm in his daily life afterwards. Many functions of the human body are supported by magic, and magic is made up of mana. It seems that the Brotherhood reduces the mana supply when it distorts the soul, thereby allowing forbidden magic to eat some of the soul and enhance the body. But why give up your soul when you can give up your mana? But if you re-establish the mana flow in the body, the transformation will be cancelled. Ryder understood. This is interesting. As he thought, he still had a lot to learn about magic. His enemies didn't realize who he was. Now the Watcher is certain he cannot be left alive. The barrier is broken. He ordered him to be killed and the stolen goods taken. Juriel called for Gaius. A spark appeared between the members of the Brotherhood. A wave appeared that pushed them away. Guy thought their actions were weak. Guy asked if he was even trying to fight or how. The Overseer ordered them to kill him, but not to attack all at once. Guy easily dealt with them, and he was beginning to understand how to use this power. Guy was killing everyone who attacked him. The enemy had a hard time believing it. The boys noticed that he used this power flawlessly, not a single unnecessary movement. Gaius wouldn't put it that way, more like just his body moving on its own. This surprised them, even though he had spent mana on the transformation and his strength had increased, but the forbidden magic doesn't let him control it completely. That's not bad if their goal is to quickly teach the soldiers how to fight. The Brotherhood members thought that he stole their technique since he uses the power of a demigod flawlessly, so he was the one who destroyed their test lab. The Overseer surmised that they were trying to attain the power of demigods. He assumed they didn't realize he had no desire to explain anything to them. But now Gaius knows that they are in communication with all of their sanctuaries. We should take that information to heart. In any case, this force is not as powerful as he thought. Gaius almost struck out at Jiral. He had learned to sense this power, and it hates humans to the point of being creepy. Guy explained that this forbidden magic recognizes humans as enemies. That is the reason why demons are hostile to humans. He also tries to cast forbidden magic spells, but for some reason his mana and the mana of the magic forbidden interfere with each other. For this reason, the time to cast spells has increased. Moves on its own. Hostile to humans. Increased spell creation time. Gaius disappointed again. He's figured most of it out by now. Therefore, it's time to end the experiments. The Watcher thought, his demigod power is gone. Such a pathetic fate can't compare to real magic. He ordered them to be killed. The opponents attacked them. Gaius wondered if they realized that they were now being controlled by forbidden magic, and whether they were serious about using such a disadvantage in real combat. Gaius calmly dodged the attack and asked his opinion. The Beholder couldn't believe what was happening. Because of their lack of control, even Guy with the first mark has enough time to cast a spell. Still, using one's own magic is much more enjoyable. Overdrive magic is too difficult to use. He used Quantum Explosion. The opponent was shocked that with the power of a demigod, they had lost. According to Guy, the whole reason was because it was a normal difference in knowledge of magic. The boys were ordered to stand. They would give back what they had stolen from them or he would kill her. They noticed he was brave for taking her hostage. Gaius allowed one to escape, but did not think he would want to return to the battlefield. Ryder drew attention to his claw. Gaius asked not to worry. Iris would be fine. He wondered what they were whispering about. Don't they realize he's about to kill their mate? How Guy wanted to ask him if he knew who he was holding. I wonder if she turns into a dragon, what his surprise will be. Iris asked why the enemy was trying to boss them around. The enemy didn't understand what was wrong with them and where their common sense had gone. Since they don't want to, let them reap the fruits of their deeds. As a result, his claw broke. Iris hurt, by the way. She pushed her opponent away. The Watcher didn't expect Iris to throw a grown man without much effort. What's a monster and not a child? Well, technically she is a monster, but as Guy realized, most opponents only judge her by her appearance. Iris said to defend herself. She threw another punch. The enemy marveled and didn't understand how she had so much mana. The demigod they were talking about was weaker than the dragon after all. He was the only one left alive. Gaius wondered what he would do, and recognized the feeling. That's weird. It looks like he's in a hurry to do something. 
but Gaius can't feel the movement of his mana. What is he trying to do? Is he trying to let their guard down? If so, he must have a trump card up his sleeve to use against them. Guy tells everyone to step back. The boys managed to dodge a powerful spell. Everyone was unharmed. Jiriel asked what it was just now. Gaius assumed a slashing spell. This attack was beautiful not so much for its power as for its lightning speed. Usually, when one casts a spell, one's mana moves through one's body and it can be noticed. And he did it in the blink of an eye. He wondered if it was also forbidden magic. Gaius turned to him. At his words, he couldn't remember the last time he had to dodge a spell from a mere human. He wanted to make sure it was forbidden magic. The boy didn't understand why the opponent had gone quiet. Reiter surmised that he was preparing another attack. This agitated Iris. Ural thought, need to be alert and prepare to dodge. There's no way for them to defend against something like that. Gaius thought the same thing. Even he wouldn't be able to defend against it. Even though Guy put up a barrier, but it was blown apart. Juriel thought that he always walks around with it. Guy confirmed it. After all, who knows when you will be attacked. Therefore, he always walks around with it. Guy offered to show him a few more of these tricks. He used a spatial spear. It's a spell that involves two techniques. And if you don't complicate it, not even a speck of dust will be left of the dragon. The guy inquired about his actions. As he thought, it wouldn't work on him. The spear broke into pieces. He was able to repel Guy's technique with his mana alone. The opponent was now strong and his actions were honed to perfection. The guys were worried. Guy's spell contained a colossal amount of mana, although they had all raised the barriers, but they were powerless beyond that. Gaius hadn't expected that he had a worthy opponent. 130 years seemed to have passed since the last one like this. He was surprised that all these guys had lost. They called themselves demigods. But then who was he? For unlike them, he had retained his former appearance. And this power just overwhelms him. He was scaring the guys. The enemy didn't know who the guy was, but he managed to interest him. He asked not to worry, guy might not answer. The lookout would be dead soon anyway. After all, the price of such power is too great. He attacked the boys. His strength managed to break Reiter's sword. The enemy's blow was able to repel Guy's barrier. Guy noticed that he was strong, much stronger than the demigod, and the opponent noticed that Guy further does not use barrier magic, but can block his attacks. While the protagonist is protected by the barrier, then tries to kill him with a non-spell, but even lack of oxygen or sucking out mana has no effect on him. Gaius asked the three of them to stay away. Iris let him take the form of a dragon, pick them up, and fly away with them. They need to stay as far away from him as possible. The boys apologized for being a burden and are really weak here. Iris took the form of a dragon. They asked Guy to take care of himself. The enemy felt that those who knew besides them about the forbidden magic should die. Gaius could not let his comrades die and protected them. The enemy did not realize who he was. He decided that he would then have to kill Guy first. Gaius may be good at magic, but he's weak in close combat. The protagonist asked what he wanted from the first mark. But don't let him worry. The close combat he took care of long ago. The opponent remarked that it wasn't bad. He threw another solid punch. It appeared that Gaius had anticipated this move. It seems that the opponent had never fought in this form before. Otherwise, the protagonist couldn't explain why he was defending with such strength. It seems that forbidden magic isn't omnipotent after all. The enemy called him annoying. But he wouldn't run away now. Gaius didn't know what he meant. Guy was merely buying time for Iris and the others to escape. What made him think that Guy wanted to escape? He realized that his opponent needed their stuff back. Gaius apologized, but they are in his magical vault. The enemy thought he could retrieve them after Guy died. Guy asked if he thought it would work. Even if he dies, the enemy can't break through his barrier. He clearly wants to take what Guy took. So it's important, but he doesn't try to take it from him. Gaius wonders what he's up to. The guy asked what he was waiting for, or wondering how to break into his vault, or wondering if it would be easier for him to do it with him dead. Guy didn't sense their presence and thought they were already far away. The enemy realized that his friends were already safe. Gaius surmised that he was waiting for him. The enemy replied that he was not, just wondering what he was stalling for. He assumed Guy's comrades were dear to him since he had let them go. According to Guy, the enemy has no idea how much. Since they had nothing more to lose, he suggested continuing. The enemy was in agreement, since he had already surpassed the demigod's strength, but he was very glad. Glad for their fateful meeting because he could fight at his own pleasure. The opponent didn't know which of them was stronger, but offered to fight at full strength. Guy didn't expect that he was the kind of guy who only liked fighting. The opponent thought that about him too. Guy admitted that he was like that, and fighting a strong opponent unknown to you brings him indescribable pleasure. The enemy has struck and told him not to be stupid. Gaius thinks he's going to let him continue to talk rubbish now. According to him, he likes killing more than fighting. There is nothing more pleasurable than killing enemies. Gaius stood his ground. He knew the enemy would attack as soon as he let his guard down, 
and he had long ago realized that he enjoyed killing. Guy wondered if all members of the Brotherhood were like this. But honestly, his attack surprised Guy. He admitted, the opponent is clearly good at killing. For an assassin, he is very good in combat. The enemy replied that he is not an assassin, just good at everything. And now Gaius is learning all that he is capable of. The power is already overwhelming him. Now he's sure Guy will lose. The enemy used a powerful spell. Guy recognized the soul defeat magic, also a series of blows. The enemy was too confident in his strength. If it were him, Gaius wouldn't think that by becoming a little stronger, he would be able to kill the enemy accurately. He was unable to break through the barrier. The enemy said not to worry, Guy would definitely die. Even he couldn't resist his magic. After all, the soul can't be protected by anything. Gaius touched his fisted hand with his finger. The opponent could not believe it. The protagonist asked, and where is death? The enemy's attacks are getting weaker and weaker, and his strength. He doesn't seem to be able to use many spells in a row, so his time is running out. The enemy was shocked. According to Gaius, he's strong in a one-on-one -on -one battle, but still, he's a common assassin. But Guy decided to thank him. The enemy didn't understand why. Guy explained that it had been a very long time since he had fought a battle like this, so now it was his turn to attack. The opponent assumed that Gaius had been preparing a spell while they were fighting. How could he be so strong with the first mark? The protagonist asked if the enemy really thought he was buying time for his comrades to escape for nothing. This is his one of the strongest spells of destruction magic. After it, there won't be a stone left on a stone within a 10 km radius. Gaius used the atomic blade. He wondered if the enemy could survive it. The enemy called him insane. Gaius told him to defend himself. The enemy was unable to defend himself against the blow. Guy has his first tag, though, he needs a lot of time to prepare. When else will he be ordered by the enemy to create it? That's why he decided to send his comrades. Not only because he cares about them, but also to buy time. By the way, there will be nothing left of this spell within a 10 km radius. He used an atomic blade. Such a spell was impossible for the opponent to survive. Gaius noticed that he chose not to dodge. This is commendable. The opponent asked not to underestimate him. He would now show him the full power of his forbidding magic. The enemy struck. There was an explosion. He thought his ultimate magic was better than Gaius' spells. Well, if the enemy is asking for it, then Gaius will strike at full power. He had prepared enough of these spells. This shocked the enemy. He just managed 10% of his power. What about 20? They were about to find out if it would reflect or not. The enemy couldn't handle that much strength. There was a massive explosion. The boys noticed it. The blast wave was big and knocked the dragon down. They realized that Gaius had done it. Wouldn't want to see him as their enemy. They didn't know what was going on there. From this distance, it's hard to tell. Iris suggested they go back. If Gaius was still fighting, they might still be able to do something to help him. Gerald is all for it, but he sent them here because they were too weak. Reiter also thought if they went back there, they'd die. But that explosion, Iris asked what if it wasn't Guy. An inner voice told her that if Guy died, she would be free. She asked who it was. It turned out to be the evil Iris, her true feelings. This surprised her. Evil Iris said that she is a proud black dragon, and she couldn't believe that Iris had joined the humans. She explained that they are good. Gerald and Reiter love her. Angry Iris asked about Gaius. Doesn't he make her study? She doesn't like it. Iris thought it was for her benefit. Evil Iris explained that in any case, if he died there, she would be free. So, it's better to fly far away. Or does she want to study again? Iris was upset. The boys asked what was wrong with her. She explained that she didn't want to study. Guy came back. Iris was not expecting this. Jeriel asked if she was sure she was alright. Iris replied that she was frightened. Reiter asked if Guy had won. Guy replied that he had not. They won. When asked, the main character replied that he was the one who made that explosion a while ago. It was his atomic blade. It was just that the enemy started using soul-destroying magic, so he decided to hit him harder to calm him down, but he overdid it a little too much and there wasn't even a speck of dust left. And he didn't hit it at full strength. The fact that he didn't hit hard enough shocked the boys. According to him, ultimate magic takes mana from the outside as well as strength. It's a pity the opponent didn't grasp it perfectly, maybe he would have had a chance. But Gaius has learnt that there are stronger men in the Brotherhood. Therefore, he plans to continue their quest for magic and the Brotherhood. He hoped for their help. The boys were ready to help him. Iris said that it didn't matter how strong the enemies were, because as long as they were human, Guy could not be defeated. Guy corrected her, after all, he was human too. Iris was surprised, and she had always thought he was some other creature. Guy announced that from today Iris would be taking biology on top of her studies. She was upset and didn't understand why he was doing this to her. Gaius remembered that he had to report back. He used the magic of communication. Juriel clarified whether they were now contacting the king and what they would say to him. 
The girl turned to the ruler. She apologized for disturbing him and hoped he was not busy. He replied that everything was alright and asked if anything was wrong. Jiriel said it was nothing urgent, but the king understood what she meant. He asked if that big explosion a few minutes ago had done Guy. The ruler realized that they were now in the kingdom of Orden. The protagonist was surprised that the kingdom already knew about his destruction magic, and his intelligence is doing a very good job. Reiter thought it was about something else. They made too much noise. Gaius noticed that it was true. He didn't think they could get the kingdom in trouble that way. But how did they know so quickly where the explosion was? Gaius surmised that the Brotherhood had already noticed it too. He wanted to ask him about how they knew. Juriel decided to give it a try. She turned to the king. The girl asked if his secret intelligence had now asked him to confirm this information. It turned out no. Guy was surprised. This is something new. The information had not come from them. The request was not from the secret intelligence service, but from the geography department. No one expected this. They have a device that maps changes when there is a major change in the landscape within the kingdom. And a couple of minutes ago the device came to work and marked a very large area. The first thing he thought of was Guy. After all, no one but him can make such a strong explosion. And as a new gorge appeared because of that explosion, the geographers began to think that Guy had returned. For only he, according to them, likes always to make such big gorges. He didn't want Guy's existence to be known with all his might and tried to stop them. But they didn't believe him and kept up. As a result, he had to tell them everything, but he managed to convince them that if it really was Guy, he himself would have died because of such an explosion. This did not make Jarilla happy. Gaius never even knew that the kingdom had such a device, and at the very least, it's been there for at least a hundred years. It turns out they were recording his battles every time. Pretty funny. Reiter could congratulate another gorge, and offered to celebrate. Juriel inquired about Guy's opinion. Guy admits that it was his magic but no one should know of its existence, and in fact, have them stop naming the gorges after him. It's pissing him off. Reiter laughed. If he keeps blowing things up like this, then everyone will definitely know he's alive. In any case, as long as the kingdom knows, the Brotherhood will know. Gaius was sure they would find them sooner or later on their own. Juriel had completed her liaison with the king. Reiter figured since they had already destroyed their second hideout, it appeared that they had already raised the defenses in the rest of the places. Gaius confirmed it, except he has their secret documents. They were willing to rip the guys apart with their bare hands for them. So Guy's gonna start decrypting them when he gets here. He wants to prepare for the next meeting with the Brotherhood as early as possible. By the way, they're almost there. Guy thought the king wouldn't mind if he took over one of his labs. Guy told Iris that their course was the Kingdom of Miles. The team flew to their destination. Gerald was worried that they had made a lot of noise. Gaius was sure the king would take care of everything. Now he offered to open the box. Inside turned out to be a magical ingot. Gaius wondered if Iris knew what it was. This startled her. Iris hesitantly suggested that it was a magic circle. All this time, Gaius remained silent, making her increasingly worried. He replied that she had guessed. It is a magic circle, but it is embedded in the object. Some parts of it are missing and some are mixed up in places. If you do something wrong when rebuilding it, it will blow the place to hell. The possibility of that frightened Iris. Gerald concluded that it was a cipher by a magic circle. Now she would try to take and compress the magic formula of this circle. But that requires a lot of mana and a lot of calculations. But if it succeeds, the circle will be deciphered and they will have access to the information. Iris is fed up with these clever statements of theirs. She doesn't understand anything on an empty stomach. Gaius asked Jerl if she knew the cipher of the Brotherhood. Alas, she did not. But she had seen it a couple of times. They called it the Aegis Cipher. Gaius wanted to know more precisely. As far as Reiter knew, it was the most complex magical cipher ever. Gerald confirmed. It takes a lot of time and effort to encrypt and decrypt. That's why it earned the title of the most difficult. Gaius thought he'd never even heard of it. Guy asked for all the cipher books and records they have. He wants to read everything and only then start deciphering it. The boys realized that he was going to study all the material on ciphers for the last hundred years. Since they only need to decipher, Juriel thought this book would be good. It's called Aegis Cipher Summary, Encryption, Deciphering, Deciphering and Compressing Information. The author of the book is unknown. The publisher is the Royal University of Aegis. Juriel admitted that they don't know how the cipher came about. But it's very complex, it's been years since anyone has fully learned it. And only the Royal University of Aegis knows about the ways to encrypt and decrypt it. She tried to understand once, but she has too little knowledge and skill. Maybe he could do it. The boy thought, now they'll find out. Guy noticed that the text in this book was very familiar to him. He tried to remember where he had put it. He retrieved the book from the magical vault. Juriel realized that he had written the book. It turns out that he did. These books are absolutely identical. Juriel complimented that there were many rumors surrounding this book. 
but now it is clear to her why the author is unknown. He simply did not identify himself on most of his books. Guy finds this unacceptable. After all, the book is just the result of his hard work and knowledge. Guy didn't understand why he was there. Iris surmised that he would now be able to decipher the documents. Guy admitted that his cipher was not so simple even for him, but it was worth a try. He activated the decryption spell. It took effect and began to decipher the book's materials. Juriel wondered if he had deciphered. Gaius did not know. One can never be sure if one has deciphered a document completely. The sentences and words are quite readable. There's a shelter marked at the bottom right there. Is that where they were the first time? Reiter noted the shelter that is where they were now. The boys asked if he had deciphered. Sort of. Only it wasn't a cipher, it was a compression of information. But it was hard to decipher even though the code didn't apply here. Ural said that because to decrypt this cipher, they need a key, a special magic circle. Guy replied that a circle with a million lines would do for the documents. Guy used an arithmetic magic circle. If you combine it with decryption magic, it would take about 5 seconds. Jural asked if he realized that no one alive today could do that. Gaius was surprised. The dragon doesn't understand what they're talking about at all. The main character thought, the important thing is that the document is deciphered and it shows the locations of the Brotherhood's hideouts, and they are authentic. He was more interested in something else, though. Where did the Brotherhood come from? That's what he wanted to know most. The one he fought. It says he's the eighth demigod experiment. Reiter surmised that there were at least seven others like him. Gaius agreed. They're doing different experiments on humans to create a demigod. The first experiment is the alteration of the soul. Guy and Juriel fall under this description. It's the simplest, and it's performed in every Brotherhood sanctuary. Since they have a map of all their hideouts, he doesn't even know where they should start from. Iris realized that their goal is to destroy all the hideouts. She turned out to be right, but he would like to destroy them all at the same time, which surprised her. Even though they are going to get rid of them all, he would like to gather as much information as possible about the soul change. Juriel suggested destroying them with magic. Gaius was sure that chaos would then reign. The other kingdoms would find out where the shot came from and it would cause a series of protracted wars. Therefore, it would be better to destroy them one by one after all. And they'll start here. The reader has seen the shore of the Kingdom of Miles and the Gears Branch. They have their hideout right next to them. Dai surmised that it appeared to be on an island. Therefore, there would be no need to worry about neighboring countries. It says it's bigger than their main hideout, so there must be something interesting there. Gaius suggested we move as soon as possible. Better yet, now. But first they would look in the workshop. Jiriel did not know he had a workshop. Reiter wondered what was in there. An incredible amount of national treasure. Iris liked that. She likes lots and lots of brightly colored glitter. Reiter's guess. Besides, they're already here. Gaius wanted to make Reiter and Juriel weapons. After all, they would have a lot of battles to fight from now on. The boys were happy about that. Iris was glad that both would become much stronger. How good it was that it was Juriel and Reiter's turn now. It looked like she wouldn't have to do anything for a while. Juriel noticed that Iris had written on her face what she was thinking. Reiter said at times like this, something dangerous usually happens. She suggested going at once. Iris offered to move them all again. Gaius stopped her. If Jural and Reiter got new weapons, he said, they would be stronger. But Iris, she hesitantly replied that she had completely forgotten. Gaius didn't know what she was talking about. He inquired what she had forgotten. Iris became more anxious. They agreed that she would study and keep her promises. He was surprised that she actually remembered. She was really really sorry. Iris apologized for ruining that strange mechanism with her sneeze. Gaius explained that it wasn't because of her sneezing. It was because of the aging of the mechanism. It was out of control because of wear and tear. Iris was surprised. She was relieved to conclude that she did not need to learn. Gaius did not like it. According to him, controlling magical power is important. This time it was a fluke, but what if her Iris fire strike accidentally hit a comrade during the fight? She wondered. Besides, she originally has great strength, so if she learned to control magic, she would greatly improve her abilities. Iris wanted to give her opinion. Compared to how people weaker than her trained to become stronger, it would be much easier for her. Iris didn't think so. Jural explained that Gaius just had high expectations for her. Guy confirmed this. Iris understood, but she wasn't sure she could learn even if she tried. Guy asked not to worry. He already had a plan. He suggested changing the place. Iris has a premonition that it will be bad. The boys gathered in the royal garden. As Guy thought, Iris knows too little about basic things. Everyone fell silent. He realized, Jural probably wanted to say that he didn't have a huge amount of knowledge either, but in his case, he had spent about a hundred years in research without contact with the outside world, so he was simply out of touch with the events of the past hundred years. Correcting such a misunderstanding is not that difficult. 
Jiriel thought that Mr. Guy lacked knowledge not only because he was ignorant of recent events. He has a different perception of people. Guy noticed that it sounded abstract. Reuter left, but he understands her point. The girl decided to give an example. She asked if it was true that the elbow joint in humans bends only inward. He did not understand what she was getting at. Juriel suggested that Mr. Guy probably thought that if you tried hard enough, it could be bent outwards as well. Guy asked if that wasn't true. It might hurt a little, but he broke and bent it with magic. Guy was outraged, because that's not how they usually do it, and it doesn't hurt a little. Guy replied that it was rumored that skilled spies could dislocate every joint in their bodies. Juriel explained that this was beyond common sense. Reiter thought so too. Guy was surprised, but she thought it was this out-of-the-box thinking that made Guy so strong, and there was something worthy of respect in that. But now he is confused whether he is being criticized or praised. Either way, Guy wants to say that Iris should learn the basics better. Iris realized what he was getting at, and she thought the conversation had already gone sideways. Gaius thought he should start with maths. He was told that he should start with arithmetic. He remembered that there were several doctrines underlying magic, but that arithmetic was most closely associated with it. The amount of magical power used to control magic, the power output derived from that amount of magical power, magic consists of a countless interweaving of numbers. It is important to get used to translating the amount of magical power into numbers. Juriel found it very enlightening. Suppose a spell requires 50 units of magical power and you only use 40, in Iris's case she adds and uses about 30. That's why the magic is out of control. Except in reality, Iris uses about 300. Reiter suggested that he slow down, Iris was already overwhelmed. Gaius replied that they hadn't even started yet. If you start from the very basics. Guy asked if she knew the numbers. She replied that she did. This is what is used to count food. He suggested we try to solve it. Guy showed her an example. Iris looked at the example and finally asked what the cross was. Guy remained silent. Reiter laughed with the words that it was definitely a cross. Jiral explained that it was not a cross, but a plus. Iris hesitated. She realized that it was called addition. Reuter was pleased that she was figuring it out. Iris replied proudly that surely a dragon wouldn't know such a thing. Gaius surmised that then she knew what it meant. Guy clarified that he about the meaning of the task. Iris thought that putting five and six together meant. When you have five and six buns, how many will be together? She asked if that was the case. Guy was silent again. He replied that it was correct. This pleased her. Guy asked the answer, 5 plus 6. He questioned how many buns would be. Iris tried to pull herself together. She pictured the scones in her head and how in the guise of a dragon she would eat them. Iris replied that if she ate them, there would be zero buns left. The boys were silent. Reuter asked not to eat them while he counted. This surprised Iris. According to Iriel, the question is how many buns before she eats them. Guy was upset because no one says such things in the addition answer. Iris did not like the fact that she was not allowed to eat. Gerald replied that after she counted, she could. She thought about the answer. Night came. Iris finally answered that it would turn out to be a lot. This upset the boys. Guy concluded that she didn't have enough fingers. Iris was upset that it came out wrong. Gerald explained that the answer should be a number, so she has five buns. If you add six more, the boys asked how many total would be. Iris wondered. She answered correctly that there would be 11 in all. Iris seemed to be beginning to understand maths a little. Juriel noticed that it's more fun when you understand, right? Iris hesitantly agreed. Guy decided that multiplication would be next. Juriel was surprised that they had moved on to multiplication so abruptly. Deus thought it would be better to explain multiplication more clearly. Who would have thought that teaching a dragon arithmetic would be so difficult? It might be one of the most difficult tasks in the history of magical education. Reiter thought he had something short-circuited. Gaius thought, whether Iris learned magic would greatly affect their team's fighting power. If successful, it would be a huge leap. Worth a try. Reuter realized that it was hopeless. Guy is in no mood to listen at all. Guy showed her an example and explained that it was multiplication. Iris tried to make sense of what was written. She saw that it said 5 by 5. Guy corrected that it was not just 5 by 5, but 5 times 5. He suggested imagining five apples on one tree. If there are five trees, how many apples are there in all? Iris was delighted with the apples, but there are no trees with them. Guy thought so. Gerald wondered what it was. They are apple seeds. He decided to plant them in the ground and use the growth acceleration. As a result, five trees with apples grew. This pleased Iris. The boys remembered that growth acceleration is a high-level control magic. It requires precise control of magical power. It was usually used over a period of weeks, and he had applied it so quickly. Gaius explained that he had simply perfected the magic. This surprised them. Guy asked Iris for the answer. She replied that it would be 25 pieces. The answer turned out to be correct. Reiter let her know that she could do anything. 
Iris was glad to be praised. Now the next example. He wondered if she could solve this one. Iris imagined four trees with seven apples on each. But there are only five apples on each. Guy asked to wait a moment. He cut down one tree. Guy asked how many apples. Iris managed to grab one and replied that there were 27 pieces. The answer did not satisfy Guy. He noticed the apple in her mouth and explained that she needed to name the number of apples before she ate them. Guy asked how many then. Iris reasoned that if there were 27 she had eaten one, then there were 28 pieces. This was correct. Guy realized that teaching Iris arithmetic would not be easy. Reiter believed that if you hurry, you make people laugh. Gerald thought if Iris mastered magical control, she would become invincible. Gaius thought about developing magic to automatically learn arithmetic. It can't be helped. We'll have to, as planned, start by making weapons for Gerald and Reiter. 